Full quarter of the Federal Court of Australia is now in session. Be seated, please. Uh, call the application. Novak Djokovic, a Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs for hearing. Uh, I'll take the appearances. May it please the court, I appear with my learned friend, Mr. Wood of Senior Counsel, Mr. Djokovic and Mr. Hartley for the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Holdison. <coughs> Thank you, Anna. May it please the court, I appear for the minister, the respondent, with Mr. Tran, Ms. Wooten, and Ms. Nikolic. Thank you. Um, before we commence, um, I will make the now usual order uh, in relation to hearing of the matter. The court orders that one, pursuant to section 17, subsection 4 of the Federal Court of Australia Act 1976, to the extent uh, and for so long as public health regulations and statutes operate to limit <clears throat> or exclude members of the public from being able to attend the court at the various locations that we are hearing the matter, uh, the sitting of the court shall continue, notwithstanding the inability of members of the public to be so present, who have not applied to the registry or an associate to observe the hearing by video link or audio link, uh, while submissions are being made uh, when, and evidence led pursuant to the uh, Federal Court of Australia Act. Two, unless the court otherwise orders no person being a member of the public who is observing the hearing uh, of the proceeding by accessing any audio or video link, including by Microsoft Teams or YouTube, may a, make any audio or video recording or photograph of the hearing or any part of it, or participate in or interrupt the hearing, provided that nothing in this order shall prevent any person based on what he or she has seen or heard during the hearing one, making his or her own notes or record of the proceeding or publishing a fair report of the proceeding. Three, the court notes that a contravention of Order 2 may constitute a contempt of court uh, and may be punishable by imprisonment, fine and or sequestration of property. Uh, Mr Holdenson, just before we commence, it's appropriate uh, that I deal with the matter that arose before Justice... Uh, O'Callaghan yesterday in relation to the constitution of the bench of the court. Justice O'Callaghan yesterday raised with the parties a matter that I requested be raised and that was the uh, impossible engagement of section 20 subsection 1A of the Federal Court of Australia Act that provides as follows if the Chief Justice considers that, an, that a matter coming before the court in the original jurisdiction of the court is of sufficient importance to justify the giving of a direction under this subsection, the Chief Justice may direct that the jurisdiction of the court in that matter or a specified part of that matter shall be exercised by a full court. The question arose whether it was appropriate to make a direction under that subsection. Uh, one consequence of the invocation of the section, uh, the subsection, is that there is no appeal to another bench of this court from this exercise of a original jurisdiction. The appellate jurisdiction of the court is exercisable in appeals from judgments of the court constituted by a single judge. The right to an appeal from the original jurisdiction uh, is a statutory right, but it takes its place within the structure of the Act, including section 20, subsection 1A. Section 21A gives the Chief Justice authority to constitute the court sitting in the original jurisdiction. Uh, if the Chief Justice considers that a matter a matter that is a controversy before the court uh, in the original jurisdiction is of sufficient importance to justify giving a direction. The minister yesterday before Justice uh, O'Callaghan 
opposed the direction, stating that there was nothing out of the ordinary in the legal issues before the court to warrant the direction. That, in my view, is too narrow a view of the words, quote, sufficient importance, unquote. The phrase refers to the controversy, but that does not require that the Chief Justice's consideration be limited to the novelty or importance of the legal issues and their character within the controversy. The controversy is a wider conception and the phrase permits the evaluative consideration of not only the legal issues, which are of course relevant, but the importance of the matter, that is the controversy, to the parties and otherwise. I considered the matter of sufficient importance for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the fact that the minister himself said in his decision at paragraph 48 that the matters involved in the decision and thus the matters involved in the controversy go to the very preservation of life and health of many members of the community and further <coughs> are crucial to the maintaining of the health system in Australia. The applicant said, contrary to the conclusions reached by the minister, that he acted illogically and irrationally. The importance of the matter in those circumstances is also heightened by the need for expedition and dispatch in the finalisation of the controversy, not just as an incident of the administration of justice or in the interests of the parties and third parties in the conduct of a major sporting event, but if the minister is correct at paragraph 48, it is important to resolve this controversy as quickly as possible for the reasons the minister gave. That this approach is not novel is revealed by how the, how the court uh, on a regular basis has dealt with other cases. For instance, the practice of the court, both while I have been Chief Justice and in years past, to use Section 21A to deal swiftly with cases of arrest of seagoing ships when the court's jurisdiction to arrest is questioned. The importance of those matters is not often from the nature of the legal issues, but from the importance of the question of jurisdiction to arrest highly valuable vessels, usually foreign, interrupting their participation in world trade and commerce. The importance of the circumstances, not the legal issues, lead in those cases to the, to the invocation of the provision. The nature of the legal issues are, of course, not irrelevant, especially the fact that as a matter of judicial review, they are unlikely, uh, there are unlikely to be any advantages of the trial judge, as, they are, uh, as is the case here. Provision is, of course, to be used sparingly given the call on the court's resources and the affectation of the rights of appeal of the parties. But in my view, it was appropriate in this case, notwithstanding the minister's attitude and recognising that minds may differ. The question of the jurisdiction to exercise, the discretion to exercise the power once satisfied of the sufficient importance of the matter was also affected here by a consideration that the decision not having been made or notified until Friday evening, having been under consideration since Monday, I assume because of the need to consider an important matter for the minister, Mr Djokovic, and the public, meant that, under, meant that unless the court as a court, not just a single judge subject to appeal, finalise the matter by today or the latest tomorrow, uh, any right of appeal of Mr Djokovic, if he lost, uh, would or may be, at least in part, made in utile because of the proximity of the commencement of the event being the purpose of his visit 
and the purpose of his visa previously granted to him. Mr Holdenson. Uh, Mr Wood will present the oral submissions on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Mr Holdenson. Yes, Mr Wood. Please, the court. Uh, just first, before you, I'm sorry, just before you start, um, I know that there was discussion before Justice um, O'Callaghan yesterday about timing and given we've started today at 9.30, um, uh, both parties uh, yesterday were clear we would finish today. The court would be grateful if we uh, could finish in due time, we would have thought, given the uh, extent and if, we may respect, if I may respectfully say so, the quality of the three submissions that we've received, we should be able to finish this argument by lunchtime. If that's, yes, not possible. if that's not possible, it's not possible. I'm not setting, the court's not setting a time limit. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, I certainly, <coughs> excuse me, I certainly do think that ought to be uh, possible, Your Honour. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can. Uh, first of all, Your Honours, can I read the affidavit formally of Natalie uh, Bannister uh, made on the 15th of January in 2022? Yes, is there any objection to any part of it, Mr. Wood? Uh, Mr. Wood? Um, no, no objection, Your Honour. Very well. The affidavit of Natalie Bannister, the 15th of Jan uh, January 2022, uh, will be taken as read, there being no objection to any part thereof. Now, uh, Your Honours, can I invite... That, that affidavit may now uh, be placed on the uh, public court file. Is there any reason why it can't be placed on public court file? No, Your Honour, there's no reason. There's no private uh, confidential... Uh, um, personal details that need to be excised? No, you're right. Very well. Uh, can, Sorry, can I, I interrupted you twice, now three times. Please, 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 Mr. Wood. Of course. Uh, can I invite your honours in that respect to turn to page 12 of the affidavit? And when I refer to page numbers, I'm talking about the numbers in the top right-hand column, which have been applied by my instructors to assist the court. Um, they didn't reach the file that when I printed mine out. So, um, I what, see. what is page 12, Mr? Page 12, Your Honours, is the first page of the, um, what I'm going to call the Statement of Reasons. But if, if you navigate uh, there, I've got the statement of reason. Now, if we're looking at the same version, and I hope that we are, uh, your honours might see that obscuring uh, at least part of the head or header or title of the document is some yes. metadata. So in my version, it says docu sign envelope ID and then a string of numbers and letters. Does your honours see that? Mm. Yes. Uh, so that is the application of metadata that's a bit unfortunate because the raw document itself uh, the header that is obscured by that metadata reads statement of reasons of personal decision by the minister under section 133c3 of the Migration Act 1958. So it's of some significance in light of Mr Lloyd's submission, which I intend to confront directly, that somehow this court can't treat this document as being uh, comprehensive and thereby invite inferences that the applicant will seek the court to invite uh, where certain matters are not discussed therein. It's of importance that the Minister himself has styled the document, quote, Statement of Reasons of Personal Decision by the Minister. So to that end, Your Honours, uh, when I picked that up this morning in preparation, I have requested, and I, I think an email has gone to Your Honours Associate, with a copy of the discrete document itself, which was provided to us on Friday evening by the Australian Government Solicitor, which doesn't have the metadata and says statement of reasons and so forth. Have your honours got a copy of that um, discrete document? I have. Yes. Yes. Uh, do, you, well, do, you wish to, do you wish to tender that for the first I do. Time? I do. Um, very well. A copy. Mr. Um, Lloyd, is there any objection? Right now, Your Honour. Thank you. Um, a copy of the statement of reasons of personal decision by the Minister under Section 133C3 of the Migration Act 1958 um, 
without metadata obscuring the heading of the reasons on the first page uh, will be is omitted and marked Exhibit A. Uh, the, the next um, housekeeping matter, Your Honour, is just to check that the court has received a copy of an outline of reply submissions that has been prepared overnight. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, and I seek, I seek leave, if, if, if it be required, uh, for that document to be filed uh, in due course today. Um, no leave is required. The document can be filed. Thank you. So, Your Honours, what I wish to do um, in the first part of my submissions is to focus quite carefully and precisely on the terms in which the document described in the Statement of Reasons has been prepared and finalised by the Minister. I'll spend some time working through that document, highlighting uh, some points uh, on which the applicant will invite the court to make inferences about the reasoning process. Then I'll deal with the grounds uh, in turn. But can I deal directly, uh, having identified the header of the document in the discussion we've just had, deal directly with what is an attempt by the Minister to cut uh, the applicant's argument off at the knees, at least so far as it deals with ground one. Ground one, Your Honours will appreciate, is essentially the proposition that the Minister had a binary, had a decision that he was contemplating making, and, if, and there were binary consequences depending on whether or not he exercised the power of cancellation. If power exercised, as he has purported to do, then Mr Djokovic is liable to detention, expulsion from Australia, and preclusionary bars on reapplication for a visa for a three year period. Uh, binary option two, not cancelled, um, uh, then able to be present in Australia and play in the Australian uh, Open. And Your Honours would appreciate that the heart of the proposition about ground one is that the consistent and material thread of the Minister's reasoning dealing with both of the subjective jurisdictional facts, in other words, both the expression of a state of satisfaction of that there may be a risk to health and good order if Mr Djokovic stays, point one. Point two, that the Minister consider in the public interest to cancel Mr Djokovic's visa, and point three, discretion. The consistent thread of the reasoning concerned the proposition that the presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia may, in substance, excite what I'll call anti-vax uh, sentiment. And yet, uh, of course, uh, as we contend, the Minister did not consider uh, the obvious uh, alternative uh, scenario being the possibility of the excitement of anti-vax sentiment if Mr Djokovic, a man who the Minister recognised was of good standing, and in respect of the vast bulk of considerations the Minister thought weighed in his favour in terms of not cancellation, and yet uh, the possibility that his visa might be cancelled, expelled from the country, precluded from playing in the tournament and impaired in his career. Generally, the proposition we put is, well, it was just quite obvious that that in itself might be apt to generate anti-vax sentiment and indeed the only evidence before the Minister uh, went that way. Now, the Minister seeks to cut us off at the knees by saying, well, because the Minister was not obliged under the Act to provide a statement of reasons for the decision, the court cannot infer or cannot find that the document described by the Minister as statement of reasons of personal decision and so forth is indeed a statement of his reasons akin to that which might have been provided if pursuant to statutory uh, duty. Can I invite the court to turn to paragraph uh, 35 of the Minister's submissions. What your honours will see at paragraph 35 is the assertion by the Minister that the leading authority is a case called Plaintiff M64 in which um, Chief Justice French, Justices Bell, Keane and Gordon uh, said a certain thing. What the Minister does not include in the quote is the ellipsis for a start uh, at the beginning of the quote, and indeed what I will now read out, which is the passage from the quote of their honours that is rather critical to understanding the significance of what the High Court said. The bit of the quote that the Minister does not read out or does not cite in his submission says, 
that the court, and I quote the, the, their honours, the court is not astute to discern error in a statement by an administrative officer, which this is the important bit, was not and was not intended to be a statement of reasons for a decision. But manifestly, uh, Your Honours, this document described by the Minister as, and I quote again, statement of reasons of personal decision, signed and dated by him, expressed in comprehensive terms, uh, is manifestly a statement of reasons, therefore does not fall within the scope of the principle cited by the Minister with the relevant qualification not quoted by the Minister in his submissions. So that proposition by the Minister goes nowhere. Can I take the court to the, to the case that amply supports uh, our argument in this respect? It's the decision of a full court of this court in a case called Talahi. It is number five uh, in the applicant's bundle of authorities. Now, if I can take the court to paragraph 72. What's the reference, Mr. Uh, it's, it's item number five in the bundle, Your Honour. It's paragraph 72. It's, the citation is 200, 240, 246 Federal Court Reports 146. This was a decision, Your Honours, concerning an exercise of power by the Minister personally under Section 501.3 of uh, the uh, Migration uh, Act, which is a power substantially akin to that which was exercised by the Minister here under 133 capital C, 3 of the Act. Both of them ministerial powers, neither of them subject to a duty to give reasons, but in both cases, described by the Minister as a statement of reasons. In both cases, the expression of uh, evidently comprehensive reasons by the Minister, albeit voluntarily provided. And your honours will see in paragraph 72 of Talahi uh, that plaintiff M64 is expressly distinguished and the same argument made by the Minister in the present case is rejected. Uh, so it's said by their honours, and I quote from the first sentence, the fact that a statement of reasons for a decision is provided voluntarily rather than pursuant to an obligation, cannot prevent a court drawing inferences about what the Minister considered material to his decision and, and I interpolate, what he did not consider at all. Now the Minister submits, and I won't read the balance uh, of the paragraph, but suffice to say that their honours observe that the inference that can be drawn or not about whether a document is intended to be the expression by the Minister of comprehensive reasoning can depend on the, the way that the document is framed. And of course, in that case, as in this, as I've mentioned, described as a statement of reasons, apparently comprehensive. Therefore, in the final sentence, uh, the court rejects the Minister's reliance on plaintiff M64 because, as their honour said, the document at issue in that case did not purport to be a statement of reasons that exhaustively explained the decision that had been made. Now, given the time, I won't take your honours to the actual nature of the document at issue of plaintiff M64, but suffice to say, it was a two page letter from a officer within the department sent to a disappointed visa applicant located offshore. It cannot be analogized in any remote way to the nature of the document that the court is examining in the present case. For completeness, uh, your honours, if it be needed, um, the Minister also refers to a decision of the full court of this court in a case called AAL-19. AAL-19, Your Honours, is one of uh, a number of cases that this court has considered in recent years concerning what are sometimes called procedural decisions that are made, uh, if you like, interlocutory to, in a sense, the making of a final decision by uh, a body such as the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or the Immigration Assessment Authority. And so there are a number of cases concerning 473DD Migration Act and the question of whether or not the Immigration Assessment Authority will admit new information or new evidence, if you like, on a expedited review. Uh, and, the, and typically, as was the case in AAL19, uh, the Immigration Assessment Authority includes, often in the space of no more than one or two paragraphs, at the start of a statement of reasons, a exceedingly brief recitation of aspects of their thinking about the interlocutory decision that they made. But again, profoundly disanalogous to the document we're examining here. AAL, like many of those cases, is not a fulsome document. 
headed, for example, statement of reasons for decision under 473DD and so forth. So no comfort can be drawn um, by my friends from AAL19 either. Uh, finally, on this point, the Minister suggests as though Talahi is some sort of outlier. The Minister asserts that it's the only case uh, that supports um, the, the principle from which we move, that in other words, we're described as statement of reasons, where apparently comprehensive inferences can be drawn uh, from the document as to what was not considered. It's by no means an outlier, uh, Your Honours. I won't take the time exploring back through the case history, but of course, in the very body of section, sorry, paragraph 72 of Tawahi, there's reference to a decision of the full court in a case called Assistant Treasurer and Cafe Pacific, 2009 case. If one tracks back through that case, one will see a very long history of this court accepting the very proposition uh, for which uh, we uh, contend. So it's important to establish that at the outset. Notwithstanding the absence of a statutory duty, the Minister has chosen responsibly, I might add, given the gravity of the matters at issue, to provide my client and, in effect, a world with an account and explanation for why he has thought fit to form the, the relevant states of mind and to exercise the discretion that has purportedly resulted in Mr Djokovic's uh, visa being cancelled, that being the decision that we challenge. Now, I will, as I indicated <laughs> there with me a moment ago, walk through quite carefully uh, the, the chain of reasoning expressed by the Minister uh, in light of the outcome I intend to develop in due course. But can I briefly mention and try to reassure the Court about the relatively few documents within the affidavit of Ms Bannister that I intend to take the Court to in due course. Uh, the affidavit of Ms Bannister includes not only uh, the statement of reasons for decision, which I've referred to, it also includes the departmental uh, submission for decision uh, that was clearly provided by the uh, department to the minister to aid his decision-making process. And in that respect, I, I won't, I'll just mention the reference. There's an email from David Brown, a solicitor at AGS, to Ms Bannister, my instructor, at page uh, seven of the Bannister affidavit that uh, closes the loop to be necessary uh, to, to show that that's the only uh, material that was provided to the Minister in aid of his decision-making process. Then there were a number of attachments uh, to the submission prepared by the Department for the Minister's consideration. There is a useful uh, index of those uh, attachments at page uh, 29 of the Bannister affidavit. Um, so it's a document itself called attachment two and headed index of relevant material for Mr Djokovic. And there's a list of attachments A through to attachment T. A great many of those attachments are not relevant to the present debate. Uh, a great deal of information was provided, including information of a scientific kind, was provided by Mr Djokovic or those who advise him to the minister following the outcome of the Federal Circuit Family Court decision on Monday afternoon and in light of the indication by the Minister that consideration would be given to 133C. Now, of course, at the time, all that Mr Djokovic and his advisers could reasonably anticipate was that the Minister for Immigration, the new decision maker, would direct himself to issues of a similar kind, which had been the basis for the first purported cancellation decision which in substance concerned questions like, uh, does Mr Djokovic in fact uh, pose a direct risk of infecting members of the Australian public? Does he have natural immunity? Did he comply with all relevant legal requirements to enter Australia? Was he exempt in accordance with the target guidelines from being, being vaccinated and, and the like? So in large part, all of what Mr Djokovic uh, said to the minister in the period of time that followed the first reported cancellation decision went by the by, <laughs> because as your honours would appreciate, and I'll come to in a moment, what the minister elected to do in this decision was to either find or assume in Mr Djokovic's favour essentially everything that was said about that, uh, and instead erected an entirely different rationale, never hitherto foreshadowed, uh, as to the basis upon which the minister said uh, that my client may be a risk to the health and good order of the Australian community that being essentially the prospect of fostering anti-vax sentiment by his mere presence in this country. 
But for present purposes, what all of that means is that much of what uh, was said by Mr Djokovic and those who advise him to the minister doesn't matter in terms of the present decision and therefore most of those attachments are not relevant. The only attachments, Your Honour, that are relevant uh, to my argument are the attachments that the minister or those who advise him uh, procured themselves, which are referred to in the reasons and upon which the minister has sought to uh, derive support for propositions set out in his statement of reasons. So those attachments, Your Honours, are attachment H, which is uh, described in the table as what has Novak Djokovic actually said about vaccines. That's a uh, BBC news article or report published only days ago after Mr Djokovic's visa was purportedly but unlawfully cancelled the first time, but before the Federal Circuit and Family Court's decision to that effect. Yes. Secondly, attachment K, which is described in the index as, quote, media reporting on anti-vaccination civil unrest, but is in fact a table prepared by an unnamed uh, person that in effect uh, summarises uh, events and refers to media concerning what might be called anti-vaccination civil unrest. And then, <laughs> pardon me, there is attachment L, which, if I, my recollection serves me correct, uh, 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 is two articles, one from The Guardian and one from ABC uh, News concerning um, anti-vaccine uh, protests in Australia. They are the documents in addition to the statement of reasons to which I'll take the court's attention in due course. But can I now turn directly to the statement of reasons uh, and make a number of submissions about what we say is significant about what they uh, obtain? First of all, Your Honours, can I say that uh, supporting what I asserted a moment ago, paragraph 13 of the Minister's reasons reports that the Minister, quote, had not sought or read the actual medical material that Mr Djokovic had provided to him, which underpinned the contentions that Mr Djokovic's legal advisers had made <laughs> correspondence to the Minister in the wake of uh, the first uh, court hearing. Uh, and ultimately, however, in light of advice that the Minister did procure and receive on Tuesday of the week just passed from the Department of Health, the Minister, quote, proceeds on the assumption in Mr Djokovic's favour that Mr Djokovic poses a uh, negligible risk and in context in light of the first dot point to 11, which picks up the assertions that Mr Djokovic had made supported by medical material, negligible risk means negligible threat of infection to others. In substance, accepted or assumed, I should say, for the purpose of making his decision uh, that Mr Djokovic had natural immunity to a degree such that he posed that negligible risk. Paragraph 14, the Minister also assumes in Mr Djokovic's favour that, quote, Mr Djokovic has a medical reason for not being vaccinated, doesn't describe it, doesn't need to, makes the general assumption in Mr Djokovic's uh, favour. Uh, then um, moving to uh, paragraph uh, 15, um, starting at the final sentence, because I think it links to what is said in 14, the Minister says, I'm assuming he currently has a medical reason not to be vaccinated. Um, so that coheres with 14. But also uh, what is said in the first sentence, where the Minister says, I will also assume that Mr Djokovic entered Australia consistently with ATAGI uh, documents. In other words, in substance, this was a central focus of controversy in the first court hearing, uh, which didn't need to be decided by His Honour Judge Kelly in light of the limited ground on which the Minister ultimately conceded error. The question whether or not construing the ATAGI guidance uh, correctly, Mr Djokovic was indeed uh, properly to be understood as being exempt uh, from uh, the need to be fully vaccinated. So it assumes that Mr Djokovic is favoured too. Paragraph 16, um, the Minister notes that he has seen the letter from uh, Dr Carolyn Broderick, uh, the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer of Tennis Australia, uh, which refers to a decision of the Independent Expert Medical Review Panel comprised of certain uh, named uh, eminent uh, doctors. Uh, and on that basis, again, assumes in Mr Djokovic's favour. 
that, or, or, or finds rather, that Mr Djokovic considered, quote, that he had a valid medical exemption to come to Australia and that he would thereafter be entitled to remain uh, in Australia. Uh, 17, Your Honour, Your Honours, is then the linking sentence. So in effect, having made all of those findings or assumptions in favour of Mr Djokovic says, I, I nonetheless consider that Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may be a risk to the health of the Australian community. The factual foundation or a critical material element of the factual foundation for that ultimate conclusion is what is contained in paragraph 18 of the uh, reasons of the minister, where the minister says, uh, I've given consideration to the fact that Mr Djokovic is a high profile unvaccinated individual, and of course we can't dispute any of that, and we don't, goes on to say then, who has indicated publicly that he is opposed to becoming vaccinated against COVID-19, which the minister calls anti-vaccination, and then says Mr Djokovic has previously stated that he wouldn't want to be forced by someone to take a vaccine to travel or compete in uh, tournaments. Now, can I take, the, I will come back to this BB so, so, and, and refers to attachment H, which is, as I indicated earlier, the um, BBC article. Now, I'll come a couple of times to the BBC article because it's important to numerous strands of our argument. But for the sake of clarity and acknowledging the many people who understand uh, following this online, I, I do want to say a couple of things about that BBC article. So it starts at page one. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Wood, can you just work on work on the assumption that I don't, I'm not sure whether my colleagues have got paginated, but I uh, printed these off yesterday in preparation for this hearing. I don't have pagination on it. So can you just go to the next year? Uh, by all means, give a page for those who have pages, but identify by something at the top of the page uh, what uh, uh, which page you're on. Uh, there's photographs at the top, there's writing, so if you would assist me in that regard, I'd be great. Yes, of course, Your Honour. So, so the document is attachment H. Attachment H, of course, to the departmental submission to the Minister. And at the top of the document, uh, at the very top, it says BBC. And it's clearly, Your Honour, a printout or download from a, a web page. The title of the article is what has Novak Djokovic actually said about vaccines? And then there is a, uh, a picture of my client. Then the first sentence of the article, which places the article in a chronological context, says, world men's tennis number one, Novak Djokovic, has had his visa for Australia uh, revoked, prompting anger and so forth. And then the next paragraph says, what has he actually said about vaccines? And then there's a discussion. Have your honours got a copy of that document? Yes. So if I can move to the second page of the um, printed version of the article, uh, it said that the Serbian star has not officially disclosed his COVID-19 vaccination status, but he's made his resistance to jabs clear in the past. And then there's a sentence that says, in April 2020, well before COVID vaccines were available, which is a matter of passing uh, note, uh, Djokovic said he was opposed to vaccination, but, and this is the bit of the article which the minister inexplicably doesn't quote in his reasons, the article says he, so that's Djokovic, later clarified his position by adding he was no expert, keep an open mind, but wanted to have an option to choose what's best for my body. And the next sentence says, during a Facebook Live, he explained he wouldn't want to be forced by someone to take a vaccine to travel or compete in uh, tournaments. Now, that and I'll come back to other features of this article in due course that are important. But for the moment, uh, suffice to note, that was the, those paragraphs that I read, but of course minus the clarifying sentence uh, concerning the statement attributed to Mr Djokovic in April 2020, which said he had an open mind and he was no expert and so forth. That is the sole factual foundation or evidentiary foundation for the minister's case about Mr Djokovic's uh, supposed uh, stance uh, 
with respect to vaccination. I'll come back to that article in due course. If we can come back to the Minister's uh, reasons. And so I've dealt with paragraph 18 of the Minister's reasons. At paragraph 19, and this is relevant to ground three, Your Honours, the Minister says, I have not sought the views of Mr Djokovic on his present attitude to vaccinations. By necessary inference, it also follows, Your Honours, that the Minister contemplated the possibility of doing so, but elected for reasons which he did not explain not to seek that clarification from Mr Djokovic. The Minister goes on to say in that paragraph, even acknowledging this, the material before him makes clear he has publicly expressed anti-vax sentiment. Well, again, one can only record the fact that those statements are from a long time ago and the Minister elected for whatever reason not to include in his reasons the qualifying statement to which I've taken the court's uh, attention. But in any event, goes on to say, the Minister, in paragraph 19, just as important is how those in Australia may perceive his views on vaccinations rather than his presently held opinion, should it be different from what has been publicly uh, identified. The Minister himself, notwithstanding the ordered identification or perceived views in the Australian community of Mr Djokovic's stance, does not actually identify what those perceived views are. The most that can be inferred is that the Minister is attributing to certain unidentified members of the public the perception, perhaps, that the extracts decontextualised that the Minister refers to from the BBC article concerning what Mr Djokovic said in April 2020 uh, are perceived by certain members of the public as still being held by Mr Djokovic. Now, I'll skip over paragraphs 20 and 21. In substance, Your Honours, they contain propositions as to the uh, importance and success of the uh, and the efficacy of the vaccine program in Australia. We don't take any issue with anything that's said at paragraph 20 and 21. Then we move to paragraph 22. The Minister says because of this, now it's not quite clear what the, the this is, but as best as we can infer, it's in effect everything mentioned above. So in other words, paragraph 18 uh, and the reference to the April 2020 views, paragraph 19 and the reference to not specify perceived or perceptions as to Mr Djokovic's views. So because of this, the Minister, quote, considers that Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may pose a health risk to the Australian community in that his presence may foster anti-vaccination sentiment, which is then said to lead potentially to a range of uh, circumstances, the substance of which is that those who are not yet vaccinated won't become vaccinated, or those who are partially vaccinated won't seek to complete that by second or third doses. Now, paragraph 22 has uh, five Roman numeral uh, subpoints. The lead into those subpoints is the minister saying specifically this, in other words, Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may lead to one or more of the following. Now, in large part, what is then set out at Roman 135 is, is simply repetitive of what the minister said in the body of paragraph 22. In other words, the speculation about the possibility that Mr Djokovic's mere presence in Australia may somehow lead to um, uh, less of an uptake in vaccination than might otherwise be the case um, in Australia, and therefore doesn't materially add anything to the analysis. But what is uh, of some uh, significance is Roman 2. In Roman 2, after adverting to the conceive, uh, to, to, to the speculative possibility that Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia might, quote, reinforce the views of a minority who remain unvaccinated uh, against becoming vaccinated, then says in parentheses this, as to which there are media reports that some groups opposed to vaccination have supported Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia by reference to his unvaccinated status. Attachments K and L are referred to. Now, I, I cannot see how there is an answer to the, the proposition which I'll just make, which is that that is plainly wrong. Mr Djokovic is not referred to once in the table, which is an attachment K, in either of the media articles from The Guardian or ABC News that are 
attachment L. Indeed, uh, the content of attachment K being the, sorry, being the table, uh, referring to a number of uh, events and media reporting thereof concerning anti-vax protests, and the content of the articles in attachment L all concern events uh, prior to this year and prior to Mr Djokovic's arrival in Australia, in any event make no reference to him uh, whatsoever. So the sole evidentiary foundation identified by the Minister that there are, quote, groups opposed to vaccination who have supported Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia is absent, and that alone, given its material importance uh, to the, the Minister's line of reasoning on each step of the process, which I'll walk the court or through, uh, is indicative of error. But of course, our argument doesn't stop there. Uh, Your Honours, the next point that I want to make is an important one, particularly with respect to ground one. I've, I've made the point that the only evidence on which the Minister purported to rely simply doesn't exist. Attachment K and Attachment L don't refer to Mr Djokovic at, at all specifically, expressly, or tacitly, or otherwise. But the next point I want to make is, in fact, the only evidence, the only evidence that was before the Minister concerning any relationship, causal connection of the most remote kind, or, or of any kind, between Mr Djokovic and what, might, what we might call anti-vax groups, was the BBC report that I've already taken the court to, which is attachment H. And I will now take the court uh, back to that document. Sorry for jumping around, but I'm, I'm trying to do it in the most legal way through the minister's thinking process. So that again was attachment H. For those with page numbers, it's page 114, the BBC article entitled, What Has Novak Djokovic Actually Said About Vaccines? Now, a moment ago, what I took the court's attention to was page two of the article, which contains the sole foundation for the fact finding made by the Minister about Mr Djokovic's supposed stance, decontextualised and without the rather important qualifying statement recorded in the BBC article, a point I've made uh, earlier. The point I want to take the court to now is at the bottom of that page two of the article, there's a heading or a subheading which says anti-vaccine activists. Now, before I move to the content of what appears under that subheading, recall the timing. This BBC article was published in this month of this year after the first reported decision of the delegate made at the airport while Mr Djokovic was in immigration clearance cancelling his, his visa, but before uh, the decision of the Federal Circuit the Family Court of Australia quashing that decision. Now, and of course, that, that was the, the, the prompt for the article and indeed the very event which has uh, focused uh, a great deal of attention in Australia and across the world on the events that have taken place since. So under the subheading anti-vaccine activists, we move to the next page and this is said, while he's been defended by fans and Serbian politicians, the visa dispute, so in other words, the dispute about the validity of the first cancellation decision, which has now been resolved in my client's favour, has, quote, and this is important, really galvanised anti-vaccination activists. Although and Djokovic has never explicitly come out in support of their more extreme positions. Now, the importance of this, and I'll go on to the examples given, and I emphasise again, the only evidence, only evidence connecting in any way anti-vax act activists and their behaviour their statements or their likely or possible future behaviour is attributed to the decision of the minister purportedly made, sorry, the delegate purportedly made on the first occasion to cancel. In other words, the only known evidence is anti-vax group anger and agitation in response to action by the state, the delegate, to cancel him and thereby to set in train a course of events that would, but for the successful judicial review action brought by my client some days ago, have led to his expulsion and statutory consequences impairing his capacity to come back to this country. Examples are then given uh, to support the proposition about a cancellation decision having galvanised anti-vax activists. It's said that in Telegram groups, 
promoting anti-vax theories. Djokovic has been portrayed as a hero and an icon of freedom of choice. Twitter users have gathered under hashtags in support of Djokovic, in other words, in the context of the cancellation decision reportedly was made, and to call for a boycott of the Australian Open. Clearly, again, in context, a boycott of the Australian Open because of the state's action to cancel his visa. That was what the anger was directed to. One influential conspiracy-laced account claimed the star was a, quote, political prisoner in detention at the Park Hotel and asked, if this is what they can do to a multi-millionaire superstar, what can they do to you? So what? that is the only evidence whatsoever, and it all only rationally and logically is directed to looking into the future, the risk of further or continuing galvanisation of anti-vaccination activists if the minister were now on this second process to make a decision that would have, if valid, precisely the same effect. Cancel Mr Djokovic's visa again, resulting in his re-detention, which has occurred, and being on a pathway to expulsion from uh, Australia. Now, unless it's not being clear, I'll say specifically and expressly, not a single line of evidence in the material before the Minister provided any specific or any logical or any probative foundation whatsoever for the proposition that the mere presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia may itself, not, not a cancellation, expulsion and so forth, which is what this article is concerned with, but the presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia may somehow, to use the Minister's expression, foster anti-vaccination sentiment. This is relevant to ground two, but let me preview the critical point. This possibility, or suggested possibility that the Minister was toying with, which is the very foundation of this reasoning process, is not a question of pure hypothesis in the sense that could one imagine conceivably, consistently with the laws of physics and human behaviour and what we know of it, is it conceivable uh, that such a consequence might flow from Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia? Of course the laws of physics don't preclude that. That's not the point. And, and I'll come to the case law cited by Mr Lloyd and his team in, in a moment, which, with which we agree. The substance of which is that when one's looking to conjecture or reasonable conjecture, I should say, about the future, one is looking for historic, past, antecedent facts or evidence upon which reasonable conjecture about the future can be made. I have in mind here, of course, Your Honours, the word may. We readily appreciate that the power of cancellation that Parliament has chosen to confer on the Minister depends not only on whether the Minister is satisfied that someone is a risk, but that they may be a risk, and that that word was included in 2014 as the product of a set of amendments and that that lowers the bar. There's no doubt about that. But there still needs to be a some kind of probative basis, which consistent with the case law that Mr Lloyd identifies with the court's assistance for that reasonable uh, conjecture. Now, the point I want to emphasise at the moment is that it's not as though there could be no evidence of this if it existed. COVID-19 vaccines have been part of our world in the sense that they've been developed, they've passed tests, and they have, to varying degrees across the world, been distributed and uptaken by humanity for now a year or more, a considerable period of time. Throughout that period of time, Mr Djokovic has been playing tennis. Indeed, he played tennis at the Australian Open 2021. He's played at all of the Grand Slam tournaments of the past year. I don't know the number, but presumably many other leading tennis tournaments. So that when the minister was contemplating the poss whether he might be satisfied that the mere presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia, the mere presence, may foster anti-vax sentiment in Australia, which might then somehow lead to some appreciably lesser uptake of vaccination in Australia. It's not as though there wasn't, if there was indeed a foundation for this finding, a reservoir of evidence that the minister might fall on. 
Mr Djokovic is a well-known public figure competing at tournaments with media throughout. If there was any foundation for thinking that Mr Djokovic's presence and participation at a tennis tournament might somehow lead to this anti-vax sentiment, one would expect that it would be supported by some kind of evidence about pro, oh, sorry, about anti-vax protests or uh, rallies or the like at tennis events or in the grounds or in the surrounds. There's nothing of any kind like that identified by the minister whatsoever. Can I make another point? And it flows from the point I've already made about the only evidence of any kind of connection whatsoever between Mr Djokovic and anti-vaxxers was the BBC article indicating that the first purported cancellation decision had galvanised anti-vax groups. There is no logical basis to, uh, to deduce or another or, or some by some other means reason that the evidence suggesting that anti-vax groups have been galvanised by the cancellation and the potential expulsion that that generated some days ago would somehow necessarily mean that if he hadn't been cancelled or if his visa wasn't to be cancelled by the minister in the second process, that those people who were galvanised by the coercive state action involving cancellation and potential removal would somehow necessarily turn up uh, and lobby or chant merely because he plays tennis. There's no necessary logical connection there whatsoever. <laughs> and, and indeed, it doesn't cohere with common sense. The only inference that can be drawn to the extent that it's necessary from evidence, to the extent that's necessary to supplement human experience, and that of which judicial notice can be taken, is that the anti-vax protests, and, and this is reflected in attachment K to the extent necessary, the anti-vax protests have been directed to action by the state, principally coercive action by the state or, or, or action by the state perceived to have some sort of coercive effect, sometimes called mandatory vaccination, or it might be strong nudges by, by the state to become vaxxed, if not truly mandatory in, in, in character. But here, the, anti, the only evidence about anti-vax reaction to or intersection with Mr Djokovic would be vegan again, reaction to coercive action by the state, cancellation leading to possible expulsion. And one cannot just say, I will somehow, that galvanised action, that anger, or that lobbying, the fostering of anti-vax sentiment would have been expressed if Mr Djokovic just played a tennis match. And there hadn't been the coercive state action. That was indeed the trigger, or the evidence suggests the only trigger for the galvanisation of anti-vax sentiment. Can I come back to the Minister's uh, reasons then? I've mentioned that we, we take no issue with paragraphs 20 and 21, uncontroversial proposition about the efficacy and importance of the uh, vaccination program in Australia. Can I move to paragraph, um, and I've dealt with paragraph 22 and I've spent some time exploring why Captain K and L, just a manifest error by the minute that suggests that the content of those attachments supports the proposition that there, there are groups opposed to vaccination that have supported Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia, just simply wrong. Uh, then we go to paragraph 23 and 24. Paragraphs 23 and 24 concern um, a matter which was the subject of a press statement by Mr Djokovic during the week just past, after the Federal Circuit and Family Court decision that essentially was a statement to the effect that Mr Djokovic participated in an interview and photo shoot with the French publication L'Equipe, despite having received a, a positive test result and your honours might recall and this is one of the attachments in the material and as is indeed recorded by the minister uh, mr djokovic acknowledged that that was approach and error of judgment now the minister refers to the, those events and that evidence in paragraph uh, 23 and at 24 the minister expresses some concern about that series of events having the potential to foster anti-vax sentiment. But what's presently important is the way in which the Minister frames his reasons 
The point being that there is no tenable argument that the body of 23 and 24 of the minister's reasons are erected as a separate and independent basis to support the conclusion that the minister ultimately makes in paragraph 24 about being satisfied that Mr Djokovic may be a risk to the health of the Australian community. In other words, quite clearly, the body of 23 and 24 is directed to an additional factor that cumulatively, together with the lead matters discussed above, being in effect the April 22, 2020 comments by Mr Djokovic recorded in the BBC News articles, that it's the accumulation of those matters collectively that leads to the conclusion in 25. How do I Mr. say that? Mr. Mr Wood, just pause there. I want to ask you a question about paragraph 24. Um, are you suggesting that paragraph 24 is restricted to a reference to what you've called anti-vaxxers or it doesn't also include people who might be wavering about whether to um, undertake vaccination? No, I accept that. It's, it's the broader. So the concern of the, I think the logical concern of the minister is, um, uh, is yes, that the, the global concern is conduct of Mr Djokovic in, in, the, in the first instance, the public statements, in the second instance, the Lakeep events, yes. having the prospect of um, diminishing ultimately the uptake of vaccination. Or do you challenge the reasoning in paragraph 24? I'll reflect on that, Your Honour, but I, the, the main answer to Your Honour's question is I don't need to. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that, uh, which was the point I was about to make, is that if you look at the final sentence of 24, what the Minister says is, I consider this, that which is just discussed, the context of which is 23, I consider this to be, quote, an additional factor contributing to the possible risk to the health of the Australian community. And then one goes to 25, and the minister starts that paragraph, which is the conclusionary one, with the word accordingly, and then says, accordingly, I'm satisfied of the relevant matter. Now, clearly, the, the sub-conclusion, if you like, the final sentence of 24, and the description of it as a factor, uh, plainly supports the proposition that it is not intended to have been the, the, the body of 23 and 24, the expression by the minister of a separate and independent basis for the conclusion in 25, but rather only a contributing, to use the word, the minister's own word, factor. That's the plain, ordinary meaning of the word factor. Uh, now, if it were necessary, we would also note in that respect, paragraph 27 of the minister's reasons, which, and I'll, I'll come to this discussion in course in more detail, but under the heading risk to good order, what the minister says in the opening words of 27 is separately and quite independently from the matters discussed above, which indicates that when the minister wishes to express, quote, separate and independent strands of reasoning, he's done so expressly. And the fact that he hasn't done that in 23 and 24, but has instead described those matters as constituting a, quote, additional factor means that even if 23 and 24 don't themselves embody legal error, assuming therefore there's no vice with the reasoning expressed therein, it cannot mean that the errors that we've emphasised concerning what is said in the preceding paragraphs is immaterial. Now, I won't trouble the court with it because I think it's really quite trite, but uh, there is a useful full court decision illustrating uh, this very same argument that I'm making in a materially similar context in a case called ARG15. Uh, let me find the citation. It is decision of the full court. Uh, citation is 2016, uh, 250 Federal Court Reports 109. The relevant paragraphs, Your Honour, are, are 73 through to 76, 
where the full court endorsed the observations of Justice McCarricker in a case called SZOR, that in assessing uh, the connection between multiple matters that are said to lead to a conclusion, the way in which the tribunal in that case quite framed its reasons is significant in assessing whether a particular finding is material to the tribunal's ultimate conclusion. And I appeared to the minister in that case and was unsuccessful in arguing that um, there was um, immateriality because there was some separate strand of the minister's reasons that was not shown to be affected by error and therefore the challenge was to fail. The court rejected that argument based on the way in which the um, reasons were framed by the tribunal in that case, which are materially the same to the way, or, or at least analogous, indeed this case is even stronger in terms of evincing the fact that the matter set out 23 and 24 are not intended to have been expressed as separate and independent bases for the conclusion that is made by the Minister at 25. 26 doesn't matter, uh, Your Honours. 26, the Minister refers to an event that Mr Djokovic was involved in organising being an event called the Adria Tour, or I'm not sure how that's pronounced, a charity tennis exhibition in Serbia and Croatia in June 2020. Uh, ultimately, the Minister, albeit referring to that event, uh, gives no weight to it because, as the Minister says, it's quite not clear that any of the alleged failures to comply with social distancing protocols and so forth uh, were endorsed or encouraged by Mr Djokovic personally. So that, that paragraph 26 is plainly uh, immaterial to the reasoning and can be uh, ignored. So pausing here before we move on to good order, we, we looked at the part of the Minister's reasons concerned with whether, whether, whether Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may be a risk to the health of the Australian community. It's founded critically on the two, albeit decontextualised and somewhat misleadingly cited, uh, statements attributed to Mr Djokovic in April uh, 2020 concerning his then views and no evidence whatsoever is provided or identified despite the fact that if such evidence existed it could have been identified for the proposition that mere presence of uh, Mr Djokovic at a tournament or at a country is apt to generate anti-vax sentiment and indeed the only evidence identified by the Minister being the BBC article um, suggests uh, that the anti-vax sentiment is apt to be and indeed was some days ago, triggered by the opposite decision that the Minister made. That was anti vax sentiment is triggered by the coercive state action of cancellation, not by simply letting Mr Djokovic play some tennis. Now, can I move to the second limb of the Minister's reasoning, which is risk to, described as risk to good order. Now, notwithstanding the opening words of paragraph 27, where as I indicated earlier, the Minister says separately and quite independently from the health risks referred to above, a material component or a, the same thread of reasoning that uh, runs through the Minister's reasoning on health also materially runs through the Minister's reasoning on uh, good order. How do I say that? Uh, we can ignore paragraphs 28 and 29 that simply refer to case law we can ignore 30, which is uncontroversial about the Governor General having declared COVID-19 as a relevant risk to human disease. 31 is uncontroversial about the threat that COVID-19 poses. Uh, 32 is uncontroversial about uh, the need in, in, a, in a broad sense for uh, governmental action in response to the crisis that COVID-19 presents. Now, if we move to 33, um, um, the, the head concept is the Minister says that behaviour by influential persons and role models which demonstrates a failure to comply with or a disregard of public health measures has the potential to undermine the efficacy of the Australian or the collectively governmental response to the evolving COVID-19 pandemic. Then goes on to say clearly, correctly, that Mr Jockers is a person of influential status. And then says, having regard to the matters set out above, and that in context picks up the discussion in the health section, Regarding Mr Djokovic's conduct after receiving a COVID-19 result, his publicly stated views, so that therefore is a reference to paragraph 18 and the decontextualised, somewhat misquoted past statements from April 2020 set out in the BBC report, as well as his unvaccinated status. I consider that his ongoing presence in Australia may pose a risk to the good order of the Australian uh, community. So pausing there for a moment, in that sentence, and at least material element of that 
which the minister says um, gives rise to a potential risk to good order includes his publicly stated views, which of course is the subject of paragraph um, 18. And the minister goes on to say, his presence in Australia may encourage other persons to disregard or acting consistently with public health advice and policies in Australia, and then gives the only example of that being uh, becoming vaccinated. Now, in 34, the minister says, in addition, so not, not saying it's said to be in addition, it, it really coheres with at least one material part of the subject of 33, which is the very words that the minister uses in the final part of 33, in other words, the risk of people not becoming vaccinated. So the minister says, in addition, uh, Mr Djokovic's presence may lead to an increase in anti-vax sentiment generated in the Australian community, which may lead in turn to civil unrest with rallies and protests and the like, which in turn might themselves be a source of uh, community uh, transmission. And then link this, you know, multi-sequenced uh, series of hypotheticals to the concept discussed by Justice Goldberg in the case of Tien, which is quite something in the nature of unsettling public actions or activities, which was a description that Justice Goldberg gave back in the day of how one might understand an aspect of the meaning of the expression public um, order. I'm sorry, good order. Um, now, 35 and 36, again, all link with uh, 34. Uh, because uh, 35 says uh, risk of adverse reaction by some members of the community to Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia. Uh, so we've got the, uh, if you like, 34 directed to the possibility of, you know, if you like, anti-vax lobbying, 35 pro-vax, 36, the minister says these opposing reactions may themselves be a source of discord and create public disruption. So we've got the idea, if you like, here of competing tribes, in effect, uh, or at least metaphorically, um, on, on the streets. And that uh, gives rise to uh, public, uh, so, to, to concern about uh, good um, order. So we can see, therefore, all be expressed as a separate and independent uh, head in order to meet the requirement of section 133C3A. Um, the minister's reasoning, nevertheless, particularly flowing from 33 and 34, picks up the minister's reasoning set out in the health discussion, which in turn is materially driven by um, the statements made by Mr Djokovic, or at least that aspect thereof that the minister identifies in paragraph um, 18. Now, in any event, and, and this will be of importance in, in a moment in the way that I articulate ground one, in any event, we then move to the separate second mental state that the Minister is required to have in order to be empowered to cancel Mr Djokovic's visa under 133C, and that is to satisfy that cancellation is in the public interest. And even if Mr Lloyd were to seek to persuade your honours that somehow the defects that we've identified with the Minister's reasoning under the health section don't materially infect the reasoning in the, the uh, good order section, the fact remains that manifestly a material element of the minister's reasoning on the public interest question concerns this very same idea, which is a focus of reasoning in the health section, which is the presence of Mr Djokovic, based at least in part on the April 2020 statements, fostering anti-vax sentiment. So I look here at particularly at paragraph 39. Um, so the second sentence in particular, so linking to what he'd said at 17, the minister says, despite my acceptance above that Mr Djokovic's recent infection with COVID-19 means he is at negligible risk of infection and therefore presents a negligible risk to those around him, I am concerned that his presence in Australia Given his, quote, well-known stance, and I'll come back to that proposition in a moment, which we say contradicts the Minister's statement at 19 and wasn't open, um, concerned that his presence in Australia, given his, quote, well-known stance on vaccination, creates a risk of strengthening the anti-vax sentiment of a minority of the Australian community. And we say that um, 
again, clearly, even if we haven't persuaded your honours that um, there's error in the good order section, although we pressed the submissions we've made about that, we have here articulated in 39 as a plainly material element of the minister's discussion of the public interest question, the expression of this idea, presence in Australia, because of his supposedly well-known stance, creates the risk of strengthening the anti-vax sentiment presented as a material element of the minister's reasoning, excuse me, on the public interest question. Uh, now, further, if it may be mentioned, paragraph 43, in a belts and braces kind of way, uh, the minister says further, still within the public interest discussion, further, the health and good order points discussed above, in other words, in the discrete sections set out above concerning health and good order, respectively, are uh, each separately relevant to whether it's in the public interest, the health and good order of the Australian community are matters of public interest. So in other words, yet again, um, we find the link, if it be necessary, despite what I've already said, to defect in the analysis alone in the health section of the reasons finds its way through the doorway of paragraph 43 to materially infecting uh, the Minister's assessment of the public interest, because he has assessed that as being relevant to uh, the public interest, which is, of course, uh, unsurprising. Then we get to the um, discretion part of the Minister's reasons. That's uh, headed Part C, other considerations, and a number of matters are set out therein. I think we've been corrected by Mr Lloyd. Uh, we said in writing that every one of these considerations that the Minister addresses here were either held by the Minister as being in favour of my client, in other words, against cancellation, or were neutral. Uh, we accept his correction that one of them was held against Mr Djokovic, although only slightly, which was the business about the Australian travel declaration, where the Minister, albeit uh, assuming that the failure of the Australian travel declaration to mention the fact that Mr Djokovic had travelled to Serbia within the 14-day period prior to arriving in Australia, the fact that that hadn't been referred to, um, the Minister assumes that that was attributable to Mr Djokovic's agent who uh, completed that uh, declaration on Mr Djokovic's behalf and about which she drafted a stack deck, the correctness of which has never been called into issue, saying that it was her mistake. Um, notwithstanding that, the Minister does say in the third last sentence, um, the circumstances are at most neutral although I'm quite minded to give it some small weight in favour of cancellation. So we accept that correction. So the only single item in the domain of the Minister's consideration of discretion, um, only one went against Mr Djokovic in a very small way. Every other one went in his favour. That matters potentially to resisting Mr Lloyd's argument about materiality of the errors to which we, um, uh, that, that we allege. Can I turn now to deal more directly, but aided by the discussion that I've just engaged in about the Minister's reasons? Round one, the essential point here on this is this. Um, the Minister identifies, at least in the prism of his discussion of the public interest, but echoed really in truth throughout the reasons, a central material concern. That concern is, the avoidance of or the minimisation of that which might, quote, foster anti-vax sentiment. Point two, the minister was considering whether to cancel the visa. Therefore, before the minister made his decision, at the point he was considering it, what he did, he had two binary choices, cancel or not cancel. If he did not cancel, um, then Mr Djokovic stays in Australia, is therefore present to pick up the concept of uh, 1161E Roman 1, and presumably stays in Australia for about two weeks, hoping that he wins some games, uh, and then goes home. The binary option two was that which the Minister chose, cancel, and subject to the possibility of that being disturbed by this present judicial review action, that led inevitably to mandatory immigration detention for the purpose of expulsion from Australia. And indeed, as we've emphasised and has become public knowledge, 
a three-year preclusionary period of Mr Djokovic coming back to Australia unless a um, evaluative waiver, in effect, is uh, exercised in his favour by the Minister in the future. Now, the only evidence, and I'm at risk, some risk of repetition here, but I'm trying to articulate ground one and its logical structure, given the singular or, or central or material concern, avoiding or minimising anti-vax sentiment, given that that process of consideration that the Minister was engaging in led to those two binary outcomes, it was irrational, uh, Your Honours, for the Minister to only contemplate the prospect of the fostering of anti-vax sentiment that might accrue from Mr Djokovic playing tennis, although it's being present, and yet not consider the binary alternative, which was the prospect of anti-vax sentiment being fostered consequent to or following from coercive state action, then cancellation and expulsion. This is not a pico Walls End argument that uh, somehow the Act on its proper construction required some freestanding matter, um, the Minister to consider counterfactuals or, or anything of that kind. It reflects no more than an appreciation that plainly Parliament is to be understood as having expected and required that the Minister when forming requisite states of mind, including most obviously an assessment of the public interest, but also in exercising discretions, is to reason, act rationally and reasonably, which therefore involves, in a relevant respect, consistently. And so it's the product of the binary scenarios and the singular concern that generates the difficulty. Now, what, what makes our ground in this respect, if I could say so, even stronger is the evidence base. And again, at risk of repetition, this court only needs to decide the case before it. And the case before it was one where there was only one single item of evidence, not acknowledged by the minister in, in any relevant part of the reasons, but nevertheless only one item of evidence before the minister that actually bore on this question and that item of evidence was the BBC report that only suggested anti-vax sentiment aggravated by the cancellation option. No evidence at all about anti-vax sentiment being fostered by the option that the minister did not pursue, which is simply letting my client play tennis for two weeks. Notwithstanding, as I've mentioned on a couple of occasions, that if such evidence existed, it could have been obtained because Mr Djokovic has been playing a lot of tennis in a public way uh, throughout the period in which COVID-19 vaccinations have been developed and uptaken across the world. Now, we don't need to demonstrate that um, if the Minister had considered the prospect of cancellation decision uh, leading to the fostering of anti-vax sentiment, that somehow that anti-vax sentiment would have been greater than that which the minister contemplated as conceivable flowing from the mere presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia. Although, again, I hasten to add, it was the only evidence that existed <laughs> on the subject. We only need to demonstrate that if the minister had considered this prospect of the binary scenario, what if I cancel? Might that lead to anti-vax sentiment? We only need to demonstrate that there was a material possibility of some such, of the Minister being satisfied that there was a prospect of some such anti-vax sentiment. Why is that? Because ultimately this was a balancing of scales exercise. And as I've mentioned earlier, all but one of the discretionary factors went in Mr Jobson's favour. If therefore there was a counter weight on the scales, particularly through the prism of the public interest question, such that even if the minister was not errant, as we say he was, in finding that there was a basis for saying that there may be a risk that Mr Djokovic's mere presence would aggravate anti-vaxxers. So even if that wasn't wrong for the minister to say that, 
if there was uh, plainly an appreciation by the minister, an assessment of this, at least through the public interest lens or discretion, of a prospect of material amount of anti-vax sentiment being fostered by the opposite decision, the one that he made, cancellation, then plainly there's a material prospect in the sense of a realistic possibility that even if the subjective jurisdictional fact in 133CA was met, that the public interest assessment in B might have differed because of the balancing of the scales, or the discretionary exercise might have differed, again, because of the balancing of the scales. In any event, all of that I think is unnecessary because, as I repeat, the only evidence whatsoever was suggestive of aggravation of anti-vax sentiment as a consequence of cancellation. Now, I think that it, if we haven't been as clear as we could have been in, in obviously the fairly limited time we had to both digest the Minister's reasons, articulate an application and prepare submissions in the 36 or so hours since we were given this material by the Minister on Friday evening. I think that the clearest and most uh, attractive window through which to view the error is the public interest lens. In other words, I can accept it might be argued that it might be open to the Minister, subject to our grounds two and three, which I'll come to in a minute. Let, let, let's assume, in other words, it was open to the Minister without any evidence to find that there was, because of the lowness of the bar in 116.1A1, that there may, that, that, that the mere presence of Mr Djokovic in Australia may generate a risk of anti vaccine sentiment. Let, let's assume there's no problem with that, although we don't agree. And let's assume that um, even if the Minister had considered the binary alternative, which is anti-vax sentiment being fostered by cancellation, and let's assume for the sake of argument that because of the way that 133C A is structured, well, it might be said by Mr Lloyd, well, who cares? If the Minister could say, well, I'm satisfied that it's presence here that foster anti-vax sentiment, it's not necessary for me to think about the binary alternative because the mere presence and the fact that my cancellation might also foster the anti-vax sentiment is immaterial. And we don't accept that, but I can see that that's arguable. But what we say is a very strong argument is that when the minister then approaches the lens of the public interest, the minister can't, given the singular concern that he identified, particularly at paragraph 39 of the reasons, and the binary outcomes of, however, he decided following the consideration of the possible exercise of power, it, it is irrational or unreasonable to look at only one side of the coin, particularly whereas here, as we've belaboured the point, the only evidence that did exist concerned the risks, um, consequent cancellation, flowing, demonstrated by the fact that there has already been a cancellation decision, albeit that it was successfully challenged on judicial review. <laughs> There is no respectfully, Your Honours, good answer to that submission. And my friend's arguments, which focus on 133CA, therefore, in that respect, missed the best point. Now, the same could be said about the discretion to the extent that's necessary. Now, were, were I forced to argue the point about 133CA, although I don't think I am, uh, or we are, uh, we would say this, that it is somewhat perverse to adopt such a narrow focal point or lens on the 133CA question and to blinker oneself to only thinking about um, risks consequent to presence when there is <laughs> before you uh, evidence bearing on risks of what is the binary alternative, which is non-presence following from cancellation. And so we, we would argue, if necessary, which I don't think it is, that the error can be seen as being located through 133CA as well. In other words, the unreasonableness or irrationality uh, can be located in A. But I accept it's the harder argument, but I say it doesn't matter because plainly, plainly it comes up through public interest that the device was looking at only one side of the coin. Plainly it comes up in discretion, device in looking at only one side of the coin. Now. What I want to do now, uh, Your Honours, is to, as quickly as I can, deal with the Minister's answer to this ground. And I should try to reassure the Court that I'm spending a fair bit of time on the Minister's reasons. I'm spending a fair bit of time on ground one. I will be much briefer on grounds two and three. 
Now, the Minister's principal answer to round one is the point that I've already dealt with, which is the assertion that somehow M64 and the quote where they omit the relevant qualifying sentence um, somehow stands against the proposition that the document described by the Minister of Statement of Reasons is, is somehow the suggestion is that it's not to be understood as that at all or that we haven't discharged known as a proof. I don't need to say anything else about that. Plainly, given the way that the document has been styled, given its comprehensive character, um, we can infer, the court can infer, that matters not mentioned are not considered or were not considered. Now, what I want to do now is, having made that point, then deal with a series of references that the Minister makes to paragraphs of the Minister's reasons, which are erected by the Minister as some kind of proof that what the Minister describes in his um, submissions as the counter, the counter argument was considered by the Minister. None of them are persuasive. Let, let, let me work through them. So paragraph, so to, to assist the court in noting that the time pressure that the court is under two in this extraordinary case, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you on those references. So paragraph 49 of the Minister's submissions, the Minister suggests that somehow paragraph seven of the Minister's reasons uh, evince uh, consideration. It doesn't. Uh, so paragraph seven simply says, and the Minister's reasons says, in case there might have been anything else that Mr Jokovic wanted to say that is not said, I've done my best to consider, to consider matters alive to the fact that Mr Jokovic's view may not have been sought on everything. But it really, really doesn't assist. Um, what, what has been said in the preceding paragraphs is that the Minister's recorded that Mr Djokovic and those who advise him did make a series of arguments to the Minister following the hearing in the Federal Circuit Family Court on Monday. As it transpired, nearly all of that missed its target because the Minister took a radically different approach to the present decision-making process, but one can't draw anything out of seven to evince active intellectual consideration of the matter that we say on the Minister's own criteria and on his own reasoning in order for the Minister to be acting reasonably, rationally and consistently needed to be considered, which is the prospect of anti-vax sentiment being fostered by a cancellation decision. The Minister subs at paragraph 15, uh, sorry, 50, then invite the court to say that paragraph 22 of the Minister's reasons um, um, support um, his, uh, the inference that somehow the Minister uh, did uh, consider uh, the counter argument, but it doesn't. Um, I, I take it that the Minister is referring here to um, uh, the reference in Roman 2 to the media report that some groups opposed to vaccination have supported Mr Djokovic's uh, presence in Australia, but as I've already mentioned, it's pretty problematic the Minister relying on that statement given that the attachments A and L the Minister refers to don't say that at all. Um, in any event, um, the point was that so far as there is reference there by the Minister to anti-vax groups, although plainly erroneously, um, it's focused on the wrong side of the coin. It's focused on the suggestion of support for presence. It says nothing about um, that which was in the BBC article, which is attachment H, which was the aggravation of anti-vax sentiment that was triggered by the first purported cancellation decision being the side of the coin. That, that, that That's the point that the Minister uh, didn't kind of consider. Um, can I say at this point, and, and perhaps I've been remiss in, in not doing this already, um, but I think it's an important submission to frame this whole discussion. Um, have your honours received a copy provided separately this morning by my instructors in a case called CWY 20? So it's Acting Minister for Immigration and CWY 20, citation is 2021 FCA FC 195. A judgment of five members of this court, including relevantly um, uh, Your Honour the Chief Justice and Justice Sanko. Now, Justice Your Honour Justice Sanko gave the lead judgment with which other members of the court um, agreed. And the relevant paragraph that I wanted to draw this court's attention to is paragraph 130, located within the reasons of Justice Sanko. And I'll read it out. It says the case is a legion in which the courts have said that it's not appropriate or ordinarily appropriate 
to infer that the decision maker has made findings or drawn conclusions not referred to in the written reasons of the decision maker. So that frames this whole discussion. Notwithstanding, if you like, that the BBC article was before the minister, and, and plainly, as I've said a number of times, provided the, the only evidence provided support for the prospect of anti-vax sentiment being fostered by cancellation, not the other way around. Um, one can't say, oh, well, um, somehow we're just to infer or guess by uh, snippets of this and that in the minister's reasons that somehow we're to infer that that was actively considered. Um, that, that flies in the face of um, the significance of statements of reasons, notwithstanding produced here voluntarily, um, done so as a purportedly comprehensive, as a comprehensive document. Uh, and therefore one can't readily be reading in active consideration that one doesn't see. So if I come back to the minister's um, references, paragraph 50 also refers to paragraph uh, 36 of the minister's reasons as somehow supporting his position. If I could take your honours to that. Paragraph um, 50 refers to paragraph 36 doesn't provide any support for his assertion that the minister did actively and intellectually consider this matter because 36 was concerned with what's called the opposing reactions. So, so this was the, the idea that I addressed earlier, that there might be different tribes on the streets of Melbourne uh, having conflict um, about Mr Djokovic and his stance or the like. But that was all directed at the possibility of, of Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia. <laughs> That's the whole discussion that the Minister's engaging with here. So there's no consideration whatsoever to anti-vax sentiment being um, encouraged or aggravated by the cancellation decision. The Minister subs at 52, then ask the court to look at paragraph 46 of the uh, Minister's reasons. That similarly doesn't help him. Um, 46 of the Minister's reasons says, I acknowledge that Mr Djokovic is now in the community. So this was the interval of time after we succeeded after the first case, but before the Minister's current decision, after which Mr Djokovic was re-detained. says, I acknowledge that Mr Djokovic is now in the community and some unrest has already occurred such that it's too late to avoid it. So what the minister is really doing here is saying, well, um, while Mr Djokovic has been present for that fraction of time, those few days, um, there's nothing I can do about avoiding that now, but I'm making a decision, so we're getting on with it. But again, the whole frame of reference is to, in this part dealing with good order, is to, if Mr Djokovic is present in Australia, that's what the minister did purport to consider, although without any evidence. But again, it provides no support for Mr Lloyd's submission that the Minister did actively consider the prospect of anti-vax sentiment being aggravated by a cancellation decision. Again, the matter about which, to the extent there was evidence, that was where the evidence went. The Minister at paragraph 53 of his submissions then asks the court to look at paragraphs 44 and 45 of the Minister's reasons. That goes nowhere. Paragraph 44 simply um, summarises submissions um, that Mr Djokovic and those who advised him made in a period of time after the first court action, which, as I've said, ultimately went nowhere because the minister radically reframed his approach. Um, I, I cannot see how anything in 44 that summarises those submissions or anything in 45 that responds to those submissions can possibly be seen as supporting a finding or an inference that the minister actively or intellectually considered that which we say he would have had to have done in order to act rationally and reasonably. The Minister at 54 of his subs refers to paragraph 67 of the Minister's reasons. This again is extremely weak. At 67 of the Minister's reasons, the Minister only refers to awareness that the Serbian government has expressed strong support for Mr Djokovic to remain in Australia and that each the Serbian government may react negatively to the cancellation of the visa. That says absolutely nothing whatsoever about what is the subject of our ground, which is the aggravation of anti-vaxxers, that being the singular concern of the Minister identified himself. Um, so that's it. Um, there are no more paragraphs that I've picked up that the Minister sought to persuade the court that this was considered, let alone actively and intellectually, notwithstanding in any event there was no evidence. In terms of the uh, material before the Minister, again, this is sort of beyond that which is necessary because one shouldn't really be going beyond the Minister's own published reasons to try to find evidence of what he considered. Um, that's orthodox principle, but nevertheless, the Minister invites the court to do so, so I will briefly respond. Uh, the Minister invites the court now to look at the department submission to the Minister. Uh, so the Minister invites the court to look at um, 
there with me. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so paragraph 55 of the minister's submissions to this court says there was a departmental, departmental submission to the minister that stated that Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may create a risk of strengthening anti-vax sentiment. And there were materials supporting this. Well, again, that deals with one side of the coin. It doesn't deal with the side of the coin that our argument is directed to. 56 to 58 of the um, minister's submissions also go nowhere. So at 56, the department cited part of the a brief a part of like the case that was presented by Mr Djokovic's advisors and the period of days after the first court case was that one one such item in the submission was a reference to the fact that there'd been a quote online poll in the age that showed support for Mr Djokovic remaining in Australia at 60 percent and there was a screenshot and there was reference made by Mr Djokovic's advisors to the fact that there was an online petition for Mr Djokovic to be free to play in Australia for which there was 83,000 uh, signatures and another reference to an online poll at 57. None of that, aside from the fact that it wasn't discussed by the minister in many full ways, so this is all just reconstruction of reasons anyway, to the extent that that's what the minister's going to this stuff for. Um, none of that has any probative significance to the point about galvanising, uh, 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 anti-vax sentiment being triggered or galvanised by a cancellation decision. The fact that a certain proportion of people in a certain poll preferred Mr Djokovic to stay say anything <laughs> about galvanising the anti-vax um, sentiment if he's, if he's cancelled. So that goes nowhere. Um, paragraph 59 of the Minister's submissions to this court um, refers to um, particular um, statements, particular parts of the BBC um, article, indeed the very part of the BBC article that I've focused on which is the only evidence that did exist on the relationship between anti-vax groups and Djokovic, and that was the anti-vax groups responding adversely to the first cancellation decision. But yet that's our point. The minister now in his submissions is, is, is saying there was evidence of the very point that we're speaking about, but that underlines the error you're on it, because this is the only evidence that there was, and yet this evidence isn't discussed, deliberated on, or considered by the minister in any part of his uh, reasons. So in summary, Your Honours, if the ministers, insofar as the minister's answer to this ground is that um, one's to glean from the references that I've mentioned that the minister did actively and intellectually consider the issue, uh, the minister's grasping at straws. There's just no foundation for that conclusion uh, whatsoever. Uh, it was not considered. I think I've already addressed the way that we push how jurisdictional error flows from that. The easiest way is to view it through the prism of public interest that it can equally be done in the discretion. And although I accept that the, insofar as the prison might be 133CA, that is the state of satisfaction about risk itself, that's a harder argument. It can be put that way too, but I uh, don't really need to go there. That leaves the, the only question being materiality. The minister's submissions in this respect are brief. Um, the minister says at paragraph 78 of his submissions, um, aptly in my respectful submission, that it might seem striking to suggest that in not that not considering an argument could fail materiality when that argument goes to matters as broad as the public interest and the discretion will indeed. Um, the minister goes on to say it's not uh, unusual, um, cites a case that's materially different to the present one, our written reply deals with it. The short point, uh, Your Honour, is that there is no way that in this domain, which concerned ultimately both in the public interest prism and the discretion, an evaluative weighing exercise. In circumstances where, as I've said, the vast bulk of matters discussed by the minister were said to go in Mr Djokovic's favour, where the minister's ultimate conclusion at paragraph 40, sorry, paragraph um, 69 of his reasons was expressed as only being that the health and good order considerations outweighed simpliciter, the many matters that went Mr Djokovic's favour. It cannot seriously be put that if we're right in saying that the minister erred in legal principle, 
baby irrationality or unreasonableness of the like. In not thinking about the other side of the coin, it cannot seriously be said that in those circumstances, in an evaluative matter, many things going in my client's favour are acknowledged by the minister as such. And where the simple conclusion was one of nearly outweighed, not strongly outweighed, not vastly outweighed, uh, that the decision might realistically to pick up the High Court's language in the recent case law of materiality have made a difference. It, it plainly could have. That's ground one. I can be much briefer on ground uh, two and ground three, Your Honours. I expect I'm probably about 15 minutes from finishing, if that gives the court uh, assurance. A couple of points on ground two. First, as I think is uncontroversial, the Minister was required so, so, sorry, to be clear, ground two is directed to attacking the minister's purported state of satisfaction in 133C3A. Uh, so satisfied that Mr Djokovic's presence in Australia may cause either or both of the relevant risks to health or good order. Now, the first legal point I think is uncontroversial. The minister was required to be positively satisfied this is not like a visa application case where the visa applicant needs to satisfy the minister. It was the minister who needed to be positively satisfied in order for the power potentially to be enlightened. Point two, which again I expect ought to be trash, and drawing from what Justice Derrington said in the case of EHF 17 that we've referred to in writing, is that to be lawful, such a state of satisfaction must be formed quite rationally upon findings of fact which are, leg uh, which are logically founded, sorry, I can't read my own notes, uh, by probative evidence. Now, as I've said, the only evidence, the, the, only, the only evidence here was the BBC report that concerned anti-vax sentiment following cancellation. As I've said, the, um, if there were evidence about anti-vax sentiment consequent to Mr Djokovic merely being in a place and playing tennis, then such evidence could have been obtained if it existed, because this has been happening for a long time, playing tennis. But no such evidence was identified. So we therefore, and, and sorry, the, and, and moreover, and this is the, the simple point, but its simplicity doesn't belie its importance, is that the only finding by the minister in his reasons at 22 Roman 2 in the parentheses is manifestly erroneous because those media reports say nothing of the sort that the minister says they say, don't refer to Mr Djokovic at all. So we've got elementary error uh, here, uh, Your Honours. Um, I think I've made most of the points in my notes already in the course of argument. Can I take your honours on this ground? Can I take your honours, however, to a useful part of the Minister's submissions? If we go to paragraph 88 of the Minister's submissions. After discussing some case law about the height of the bar or the lowness of the bar, more aptly in 1161E1, maybe a risk. Um, the Minister usefully says this, that the forward-looking and low probability features of the matter of which the Minister needed to be satisfied are important. Facts about future conduct are not the same as facts about the past or the present and cannot be proved in precisely the same ways or to the same degree of confidence. We agree. Proof of future possibilities is very similar to proof of past hypothetical situations, uh, which is made clear by the High Court's discussion of a couple of cases that they mentioned. We agree. As to the consideration of hypotheticals, and thus as to the proof of future possibilities, it's been recognised that the inquiry necessarily proceeds by drawing inferences from known facts. We agree. And based on reasonable conjecture within the parameters set by the historical facts, we agree. Where, I ask rhetorically, in the material before the Minister, was the known or historical fact or occurrence that rationally founded the minister's purported state of satisfaction 
that the mere presence in Australia of Mr Djokovic um, may be apt to generate the consequences that the Minister speaks of in his reasons, including generating anti-vax sentiment. As I've said, there's been ample historical period within which if evidence facts existed, they could have been identified. None were. None were before the minister. None were identified. The minister's subs, Your Honours, at paragraphs 90 to 96, I won't read them all out, but let me just say globally, misstate or misunderstand our argument and don't therefore properly respond to it. The question is not for this ground, was there evidence capable of supporting um, a finding about Mr Djokovic's stance or position on vaccination? That's the subject of ground three I'll come to in a moment. So, so set that aside for a moment, I'll come to that in ground three. Ground two is connected to the, with the proposition that there needed to be to use the Minister's concepts in paragraph 88. Known facts or occurrences, something, skerrick indeed, of evidence that supplied the basis for the reasonable conjecture with which 1161E1 is concerned about presence causing anti-vax sentiment with all the consequences for people not taking up vaccination and the like. But, but there was none. <laughs> now I move to ground three. Mr Wood, before you do that, can you help me with a point of clarification? In paragraph 41, you referred to uh, some observations that Justice Derrington made in EHF 17. And the point about the test of reasonableness in relation to a subjective state of satisfaction has been considered in many High Court cases, including Eschert. Are you um, suggesting that what Justice Derrington said is, is the same or any different? Uh, it, it, it is the same, and indeed EHF 17 is a case where Justice Derrington engaged in an extremely detailed discussion yeah. of matters bearing on the review of subjective jurisdictional facts. His Honour's analysis was endorsed by full court, Pascal Singh, I'm sorry I don't have the citation, albeit that his Honour was a member of the majority of that full court that endorsed it. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't perceive there to be, and I don't think there is, um, any relevant divergence between the proposition that we've cited in paragraph 41 of Justice Derrington, which was picked up and applied by Justice Bank Smith and Leota, and the High Court jurisprudence to which you refers, which indeed Justice Derrington discusses in the HF. Right, thank you. Mr Wood, there may be some uh, necessity to recognise that the word evidence should not mislead one into thinking that what is really necessary is that there be material before a decision maker, which material includes um, the rational and reasonable use of perception and common sense and place of the decision maker uh, in the position he or she is in. Now, that's been traversed by the High Court last year in Viani to a degree, which uh, you may assume that the court is aware of. But I think one needs to be careful about speaking about evidence in the sense of litigation. If one's in the AAT, however, that is the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or a court, one uh, will be talking about evidence and admissible evidence and the like. Before a, tr before a decision maker, it's the legitimacy of the material that's before the decision maker and whether or not it is of uh, sufficient 
character, uh, including what can be drawn from both common sense and uh, the, per the perception of the minister relevantly to matters in the community. I accept that. Um, can, I, can I move to ground three? Ground three is concerned with uh, aspects of the minister's reasons that relate to my client's supposed stance on vaccination. And I start with this observation that there is a contradiction within the minister's own reasons on this topic. As I indicated earlier, in paragraph 19, uh, paragraph 18, the minister refers only to historic, decontextualised and not fully quoted, um, evidence of historic views of Mr Djokovic without the full quotes and so forth. And in paragraph 19, <coughs> excuse me, the minister says, I have not sought the views of Mr Djokovic on his present attitude to vaccination. Now, uh, not only does that imply, as I indicated earlier, that the minister contemplated doing so but decided not to for whatever reason that he didn't explain, but it also necessarily implies that the minister accepts that he therefore doesn't um, know what Mr Djokovic's present views are. And to put that in further context is to be recalled that the BBC report that referred to what Mr Djokovic said in April 2020 were, as indeed the report shows, statements not fully quoted by the Minister attributed to Mr Djokovic before COVID-19 vaccines had even been developed, tested and uptaken throughout the world. And indeed, it is material in that respect, and it is significant that the minister does not cite what one would think would be a rather significant qualification identified in the BBC article, which is attributed to Mr Djokovic, <coughs> which was that he was no expert to keep an open mind. Now, so bear in mind paragraph 19 with the implications that flow from it that I've just mentioned. And then go to paragraph 39, which is located in the discussion about the public interest. Recall that in paragraph 19, which was located in the part of the reasons that concerned health, in other words, the subjective jurisdictional fact 133C 3A, intersecting with 1161E round one, and in that part, dealing with health, the minister said he, well, he was concerned about perceptions as well. He didn't say what those perceptions were, but he said, well, even though I not, don't quite know what Mr Djokovic thinks in substance, uh, I think the public perceives him as having certain views, even though he did not identify what those perceived views were. But nevertheless, when we come to the public interest, what relevantly the minister says in the second sentence of um, 39 is having passed over the fact that he assumes or accepts that Mr Djokovic in fact only poses a negligible risk of infecting other people. It says, I'm concerned that his presence in Australia, given his well-known stance on vaccination, creates a risk. What is that well-known stance? The minister doesn't identify it, and the minister couldn't possibly identify it, because as the minister said in 19, including by implication, he didn't know what it was and he decided not to ask. Now, setting aside issues sometimes perhaps inaptly referred to as duties to inquire and so forth about which we've made some submissions. There is an essential problem within therefore the body of the minister's own reasons uh, in that respect. The minister in 39 and perhaps also reinforced by 42 in the public interest discussion 
focus is an effect on well-known, implicitly actual, not simply perceived, perhaps wrongly, stance, and yet doesn't know what it is. Irrespective of duties to inquire, it is in a more elementary sense not open uh, to the minister to base reasoning in 39 in light of the qualifications that he himself made in 19 uh, correctly. We otherwise rely on our um, written submissions, if it please the court. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Lloyd, um, we perhaps might break at 12 uh, for lunch at 12.30 um, for, say, uh, uh, an hour or so. So depending on um, how long you think you'll be, if you want to take the first, um, we might we may break slightly earlier than that. But uh, if you want to take the first forty-five minutes to an hour, um, structuring what you want to say before we have the break, that's convenient to you. Thank you, Anna. I'll, I'm happy to do that. Um, I will proceed on the assumption that the court has has had the opportunity to and has read our written submissions, and I you will assume on both on both assumptions. Thank you, Anna, and I'll largely be speaking to them. We've tried to put as much in them to sort of save time as possible, so I'll take that approach. Um, the applicants' grounds rely upon one of three findings they asked the court to make. First, there is that there was no evidential basis to conclude that the applicant was opposed uh, to vaccination against COVID-19. That's at the heart of ground three. The second is that there is no evidential basis to conclude that the applicant's presence in Australia may foster sentiment opposed to vaccination against COVID-19. That is at the heart of ground two. And thirdly, that the minister failed to consider whether cancelling the applicant's visa would foster sentiment opposed to vaccination against COVID-19. That is his binary argument. And that's a finding which is critical to ground one. We, we will contend that none of those findings should be made. Um, they involve, of course, a consideration of the reasons of the minister and the submissions and material before him. We have prepared two annexures. Uh, if, if the court has handy um, our written submissions, if that, I can ask the court to go to that. And starting, first of all, with page 28 of the submissions, there's an annexure which extracts um, the, the material or evidence before the court. Um, uh, uh, that we say is is relevant to the issue of Mr. Uh, of the applicant's views about COVID-19 vaccination and, and indeed for steps that flow from that. In relation to a question that Your Honour, the Chief Justice asked about the nature of um, evidence, we certainly embrace the view that it isn't limited to something like evidence before a court. Administrative decision makers typically uh, inform themselves by a, a much broader range of materials. And just for the reference, for the court records, I'll, I'll refer to a decision FUD 18 and the Minister, uh, 2020 FCA 48 at paragraph 53. Um, but then going back to the next B, um, your honours will see that it's in tabular form. Uh, some of this material you've been taken to, but it's just convenient to go through it in this form. Um, uh, relates to grounds two and aspects of ground, oh, ground three and aspects of ground two. We say we acknowledge that there are inferences uh, or that inferences are drawn from this material, um, but we say that the, the inferences that are drawn are certainly open. Um, we also have mentioned in our submissions that the high, recent high court case in Vian and, and the broad scope that that allows for the minister to have regard to, you know, common sense and personal knowledge about things. And, and that needs to be taken into account, we say. 
Um, now, I, I won't go through the whole table, but I'll just uh, go to a few points. The first item, well, taking the first item to show how the table works, uh, the number on the left-hand column is the page number from the affidavit of um, Ms. Bannister, which the court has. So if the court's looking for this material later, that's where you honest will find it. And then there's a pinpoint reference for where to find it within that material. And then column three extracts the material that we rely upon. And I suppose the underlining um, draws attention to the particular bits of the extracts that we rely upon. Um, now, the first page deals with, um, in this case, material that was in um, the submission to the minister, and the next two pages, three pages, deal with material that was in the attachments to that. Um, now, starting at the first item, it draws attention first to the applicant being a high profile, unvaccinated individual. And, and that, my friend fairly said, is not in contest. That is certainly true. Uh, it's not just for the applicant's public statements that he is opposed to vaccination. It is the fact that um, his ongoing non-vaccination status up to and including January 2022 20, at this stage of the pandemic. It's open to infer that a person in the applicant's position could have been vaccinated if he wanted to be. Um, and we would say that this falls within the Vian kind of reasoning, um, that he's still unvaccinated reflects a choice on his part to remain unvaccinated, even when he could be vaccinated. The material before the minister permitted him, him that is the minister, to rationally to assume that the applicant had a temporary reason since being infected in, in December of 1991 with COVID for not being presently vaccinated. That is to say, the minister's reasons are prepared to assume that because he was infected in, in mid-December, that that's a reason why he couldn't have been vaccinated since mid-December. But of course, um, there's nothing to suggest that in, in the year or so before then, when vaccines were available, um, that, that is just his choice. That's why he isn't vaccinated, or at least it's the minister is entitled to assume that it, that it was his choice. Um, certainly, there's never been any material presented to the minister or, or any claim that I'm aware of that uh, the applicant had any other medical reason for not being vaccinated. He, his sole medical reason for not being vaccinated was that he was infected in mid-December and that gives rise, at least on some views, to a need not to be vaccinated for a period of time. Now, we say that that choice um, may support an inference as to his views um, against COVID-19 vaccination. The passage in the annexure goes on to refer, that's, that's um, the first, uh, first bit of the document, goes on to refer to a note that says, he has publicly opposed becoming vaccinated against um, COVID-19. Now, it is a quoted uh, passage that supported that characterization um, of him being opposed to vaccination. Um, item three, th th this is what was in the submission to the minister. Item three on in this table largely repeats that. It characterizes his vaccination as being well known. That was how, what the department characterized it for the minister. Um, And we say that by the time that the minister made his decision, which of course is several days after the previous decision, it was unambiguously true that it was well known uh, what, what the applicant's vaccination status was. And, and, uh, and then anyone could infer, we would say, that somebody who had by this time not been vaccinated um, was doing so by a choice to, to not be vaccinated. Um, turning over the page, there's then primary evidence from the attachments. Um, in the third item, which is attachment H to which the court has been taken already, um, uh, that's from a January 
article of this year, there is a, a passage about being opposed to vaccination in the first paragraph in that section, um, or saying that he was opposed to vaccination. Um, so that supports something that's in the, in the minister's reasons. It was before vaccinations were available. He said that before vaccinations were available. Now, the applicant s seems to say that that diminishes the usefulness of reliance upon it because vaccinations weren't even available. But we say, if anything, it strengthens it. So even before vaccinations were available, he was against them. His prima facie position is to be against them. Sure, he, he left open the possibility that he might change his mind, but nonetheless, uh, he's publicly stated position was that he was he was um, uh, not in favour of taking vaccines. Uh, and uh, so far as we're aware, that publicly stated position has not been updated. So he, he hasn't, so there was a statement issued, which is attachment O last week, in which uh, the applicant made statements pertaining to this issue. He didn't, he didn't retract or offer any different view. Um, uh, he's not, after all this time, vaccinated. So we say that the fact that he might change his mind one day is, is doesn't make the minister's inference about his, his views on vaccines um, not open. Um, and of course, once it's open, it's for the minister um, to evaluate that material and we say that um, that that's what happened. Now, two paragraphs further down, but within the same entry, um, a statement could be fairly characterised as opposition to, to vaccination, when he says he wouldn't want to be forced by someone to take a vaccine to travel or to compete. I mean, it's certainly not supporting of vaccination, and it's not even neutral about vaccinations. Uh, it, it is a view which could, could be seen as... Um, uh, consistent with the minister's uh, inference. Um, and then at the, still within the same item, but immediately before the heading anti-vaccine activists, there is the, uh, an expression about um, creating misconceptions and that, he, that the applicant was accused of creating misconceptions. In context, that's about, about vaccination. So again, that is material which supports it, provides, we say, a firm basis to, um, uh, to draw a view. All of that material and all of the reasoning that I've canvassed provides a firm basis by which the minister could draw the inference that he did. There's then a heading about anti-vaccine activists, which the court has been taken to in the substantive document, but here there's a reference to it having galvanised activation, acti sorry, galvanised anti-vaccination activists. Now, one point that is you know, repeatedly put against us is this horrible, horrible error. Um, your honours have handy paragraph 22 of the Minister's Statement of Reasons. Um, my friend repeatedly says, K and L, attachments K and L don't support the words in the brackets. Um, no, but K and L don't appear within the brackets. K and L appear afterwards. K and L support the first part of the sentence, a, a reinforcing of views of the minority in the Australian community who remain unvaccinated against COVID-19 and who are at risk of contracting 19. That's what attachments K and L relate to. Then there's a bracketed text, as to which there are media reports that some groups opposed to vaccination have supported Mr. Djokovic's um, presence in Australia. And um, you know, th this, this document, the, the material under anti-vaccine, is clearly evidence of that. And my friend took the court to it. I mean, the mere fact that it doesn't say attachment H in 22.2 doesn't mean the minister hasn't read it or relied upon it. He, he refers to having relied upon it, contrary to one of my friend's other submissions that it's not referred to in paragraph 18. So the minister clearly read attachment H. He, he's, he's, he's referred to it expressly there. And um, the, the great sin is he hasn't mentioned it again in, inside the brackets in 22.2. 2. 
it's not a basis of there being some fundamental lack of evidence. The, there is evidence, and, and my friend took it to it. And then one sees at the end of that H a reference to so-called anti-vaccination groups um, treating um, the applicant as a hero or as an icon of free choice. Um, now, the next item is, is P. I won't go through all of that. That relates to um, a tour that the applicant was involved in running. Um, but I just draw attention to the third bit of underlining where it, under, where it says page 144. So, so that article says, but he was hardly a big winner during the forced off season. He generated concern and controversy by questioning vaccination. So that's further evidence about um, Mr. Djokovic's view about vaccination. Um, uh, So I'll leave an extra uh, B here and go to an extra A. So that's that's the evidence that we will ultimately rely upon when we come to our substantive submissions about that. Now an extra A uh, deals with a slightly different thing. That th this deals with the evidence that pertains to um, uh, what we have called the counter argument, but my friend refers to as the sort of the binary matter not considered. Ultimately. We say it's a matter of did the did the minister consider the consequences of his decision, um, and we say that this shows that he did consider it and he considered it broadly, um, uh, and in a way that, for reasons I'll come to when I develop the substantive submissions, uh, is inconsistent with any suggestion that you know the issues weren't considered at all, which is how my friend um, would put it. So the first table in an extra A uh, uh, is, is drawn from the minister's signed statement of reasons. The second table is from the submission to him and the third table is from the attachments to that submission. But going to the first item on the first ta the first sort of sub table, um, at paragraph 10 of the reasons, that shows we say the minister was aware of some activity community opposition to vaccination. So um, that's what we rely upon that for, the, the sort of awareness of community opposition. It's hard to imagine anyone in Australia is not aware of that, but if, if it be needed to be shown, the minister is aware of it. Um, the third item, paragraph 22, refers to uh, media reports that vaccination opposition groups have supported the applicant's presence in Australia. Um, uh, and so that I think is, I've already dealt with that under 22.2, so I maybe don't need to deal with that again. Um, the fourth item deals with paragraphs 35 and 36. Um, in 36, it refers to opposing reactions. So that shows that the minister is aware that there's opposing groups in relation to Interalia, the anti-vaccine issue um, uh, that, that pertain to um, Mr. Djokovic and Mr. Djokovic's presence in Australia. That was a perception of the minister of opposing reactions. So it's not just the minister looking at one side. He, he appreciates that there are segments of the community that hold strong views both for Mr. Djokovic um, and his views on vaccine and against them. Um, then the sixth item, which is paragraph 45, we say further identifies the minister was aware of groups supporting the applicant's presence in Australia um, and that uh, they may be a source of, uh, sorry, I'll withdraw that, uh, and, and thus but such groups would be opposing the cancellation, which of course is the opposite side of the decision that he, of the binary decision. And then paragraph 46 contains specific reference to a measure of unrest in the community that had already occurred. That unrest refers to unrest from supporting groups of the applicant, especially after the first cancellation decision. Uh, we say, um, uh, 
uh, attachment A in in the in the attachment section of the of the uh, report at the bottom of that page, attachment A in a letter from the applicants or is a letter from the applicants. Um, uh, solicitors and it refers to the fact that there was vocal support for the applicant to, to remain and play. That support could plainly materialise into discord and unrest and dissent or, or resentment and Minister should be taken to be, have been aware of and factored that in, we would say, or to have taken it into account when he was exercising his broad public interest um, considerations and discretions. Um, then there's a reference to attachment H, which I've already taken the court to in a sense. Uh, it has a reference to the galvanizing of anti-vaccination activist groups um, and, and refers, as I've said, to the minister, uh, to the applicant being a hero for, for some of those groups. Uh, attachment L at the bottom um, is the minister being aware of other activities that anti-vaccine groups do that, that might cause unrest and protests. Um, now that's all I need to do by way of evidence. I'll now move back to the body of our submissions. Um, from paragraph seven to paragraph 12, we briefly summarize um, uh, the reasons of the minister in concluding that the applicant's presence in Australia may be a risk to the health of the Australian community. Um, we do it succinctly at this point, at the beginning, just to show that while the applicant might not agree with the reasons, it's not illogical or irrational. Um, uh, and so we say, I, I, don't, I won't rehearse them, but they stand for themselves when we say that they're um, at the very least open, if not kind of obvious. Um, I don't understand that the, the applicants actually dispute the logic of that per se. Rather, they take issues with two steps in it. First, they say that it's wrong to have characterised, that it wrongly characterises the applicant as being opposed to COVID-19. Um, and secondly, that even if he was, that one could infer that his presence in Australia would foster others to share his sentiment and behaviour about vaccines. Now we've already addressed the evidence pertaining to that, um, so I'll, I'll make some further submissions on that later, but that's the structure of the reasons on that. Then in the next section, B, B1.2, we address the Minister's reasoning on good order. Um, Mr. Mr Lloyd, can you just help me in this regard? Um, the terms of the provision Section 116, in Section 116, is that what will occur because of the visa holder's presence, the, pre the present visa holder's presence um, uh, or continuing presence in Australia. Um, how do you put essentially the counterfactual or counterargument? Doesn't matter how you describe it. If you could just summarise the, the the point for me, I mean, leave aside the evidence for the moment. One could see in a <clears throat> situation where it was plain to anyone with common sense that cancelling the visa would cause overwhelming uh, <coughs> public discord and risks of transmission through very large public gatherings. And one, one could see, in a sense, the counterfactual overwhelming, the mere focus on the focus on only on, if it be only a focus on uh, the consequence of, of presence. But the, putting to one side, I think, for the purposes of present argument, that kind of obviously overwhelming risk of mass demonstrations, 
of very of huge numbers of people. Um, how do you how how is it that one needs to be precise or focused upon the counterfactual? Well, I suppose I mean I will come to this, but at the, the starting point we would say is that section 116.1e doesn't call for a counterfactual at all. So uh, it just asks to look for the presence of a person in Australia. And in a sense, the idea of asking for a counterfactual raises the somewhat surprising notion that Australia would, when deciding whether or not to um, uh, cancel a visa, might have to avoid cancelling a visa um, somebody who's you know actually presenting risks when they are in Australia um, in relation to sort of Australia's sovereignty in determining who gets to come to Australia is held at risk because um, uh, the cancellation might lead to adverse consequences. We say that that isn't a mandatory consideration. We accept that it is it is relevant. We're not saying it's it's excluded, but we don't say it's required. Um, and here our answer is that, in a sense, it was all obvious and it was obviously the minister was aware that his decision to cancel would result in some level of further unrest. But the minister, no doubt, was principally concerned, as he says, it was, an, uh, it was a primary concern that Mr Djokovic's um, presence would encourage people to emulate his his position and that would put the health of Australians at risk and, and that was the concern. So on, on one side maybe there is, as he accepted, some measure of unrest might flow, but on the other side there was a concern that um, it would encourage people in two respects. One, one is the sort of the paragraph 18 to 22 respects, which is to say it would help foster um, Mr Djokovic's um, what is characterised as an anti-vaccination sentiment. That's one concern. And that's the second concern, which is, and I, and I should say here, just to interrupt myself, not, not just amongst anti-vaccination groups, but amongst the Australian community. That's that's the concern. It's, it's not just that. It's clear in the minister's reasons that he, he talks about others and stuff. It's not limited to anti-vaccination groups emulating him. The concern is that, you know, he, he's a high-profile um person who is in many respects a role model and certainly for many people um, and so that um, his presence in Australia would you know present more strongly um, and more currently to Australians um, his, his anti-vaccination views and, and at the same time referring to what is said in paragraph 24 um, uh, the applicant has at least some history and some recent history of ignoring COVID safety measures. So there's a reference in paragraph 23 to him, even when he was infected and had received a positive test, he, he undertook an interview and a photo shoot, which included taking his mask off. Now, you know, that's publicly known. Um, and he, the minister took the view that his presence in Australia would encourage people to emulate his apparent disregard for those kind of safety measures. Now, in that respect, the reasoning, which is, we say, quite rational and cogent, is that when you have somebody in his position who, as your honours will all know, and this again is falls within the common sense idea, you know, people use high-level um, athletes to promote ideas and causes all the time. Um, the applicant himself, no doubt, has many advertising arrangements with different clients. Um, so this is not, I'm not saying this is advertising, but his connection to, uh, to a cause, whether he wants it or not, is still present. Um, and his presence in Australia was seen to pose uh, an overwhelming risk, um, and that's that's what has motivated the minister, as he says in his reasons. We say. Um, I think I was just going through the, 
the section B1.2 in my submissions, which runs from 13 to 19, I won't re restate the summary of the reasoning process there, which goes mostly in 15 and 16. Um, in, in 18 and 19, we do set out um, extracts from the reasoning of His Honour Justice Goldberg in Tian and then um, Justice Branson in Newell, um, and we've emphasised certain passages in, in the bit that has been quoted. And we think that that is ultimately important to understand that good order um, is not limited to just breaches the law, but involves, you know, difficulties or public disruption in relation to the values, balance and equilibrium of Australian society. It involves something in the nature of unsettling public actions or activities. Um, and then in relation to Newell, that was a case in which the person themselves had done nothing in particular, I mean, not in Australia, um, and there was no fear of the person doing anything in Australia, but just that the person's presence here would lead to an adverse reaction by other members of the Australian society. And, and so that, that just shows that the minister's approach is well within the accepted um, uh, meaning of uh, 116.1e1 of the Act. Um, and paragraph 20 just seeks to reinforce that by saying that um, the legislative history shows that, and this will be relevant later, but if your honours um, have that handy, your honours will see that um, the current version says the presence of the hold in Australia is or may be or would or might be a risk to certain things. Um, now, when, when these decisions were made, it actually only said is or would be. So um, uh, the, the test which was made was that, and then there was a then there was a reenactment to lower the threshold, and I'll come to this later, to be is or may be, or would or might be. So it sort of lowered the standard or the threshold maybe before uh, the power arose. But what the parliament didn't do is change the meanings or change the wordings of health, safety, or good order. And according with normal statutory construction principles, that should be construed as parliament adopting the judicially attributed meanings to those expressions. Um, the next section of our submissions, um, which start at uh, B2, deal with some matters of detail in Mr. Djokovic's submissions, and I, I won't address those orally. Um, in paragraphs 25 and 26 of our submissions, summarise um, ground one of the applicant's case and also identify the, the term counter argument, which we've used as a kind of an abbreviation for the notion that's expressed in paragraph 26. Um, now that refers to a consideration that the applicant was not, the applicant says was not taken into account. And at 28, we identify three reasons why this ground should fail. The first is that the ground is dependent on the court making a finding of fact that the minister did not take that argument, the counter argument, into account. Um, we say that finding should not be made. Um, we, we would say, if need be, that the minister um, you know, did consider that matter, um, but we don't need to go that far. It's enough for my client to succeed on this point for the court simply not to make the finding that the minister didn't consider it um, because they have the onus. And if the court doesn't make that finding, ground one um, essentially disappears. Secondly, um, the second reason is that we rely on a legal proposition that the minister, um, or rather the ground relies upon a legal proposition that the minister was bound by logic or reasonableness to take that consideration into account. Um, we take issue with that. And then thirdly, there's a question of materiality, which I will address as well. Now, our first proposition is that the court should not find that um, this issue was not taken into account. 
Now, there's a heading C1 on page six of our submissions, um, which, is, which addresses this topic uh, and starts off by addressing some foundational principles. Um, 30 and 31, your honours can see they're largely motherhood um, propositions. Um, but we note, note in particular the conclusion that the minister didn't consider something as a finding that shouldn't lightly be made. And we rely upon the cases in footnote eight for that. Um, uh, I won't go to any of those cases, I should say. But the next propositions, the next bundle of propositions all relate to how the court should undertake this fact-finding task. Paragraph 33 indicates that an omission in a statement of reasons is insufficient to infer that a matter has not been considered. Now, um, another way of putting that is, even for a person under a duty to provide reasons, it's not necessary to re refer to everything in those reasons. And we refer in footnote nine to sundry cases that support that proposition. Um, but we're not in that case. Um, the applicant's position might be a bit stronger if we were, but there is an important difference between um, persons who are, have a duty to elaborate a statement of reasons and persons who don't. And the fourth proposition, which is in paragraph 34, um, is that where a decision maker is not under a duty to provide a statement of reasons, it, it just logically becomes more difficult to infer that non-consideration um, from any omission in a statement or a partial statement that is given. If your reasons don't have to be comprehensive, the failure to mention something is obviously less readily um, a basis to assume that it wasn't considered or to infer that it wasn't considered. And that proposition is um, clearly set out in paragraph 35. Um, my friend takes issue with us leaving out something in, in, in that. Um, uh, we, we resist that uh, and we resist that because um, as the cases, as we note in paragraph 12, that principle discussed in paragraph 35 has been applied broadly in the federal court to areas where people are voluntary, um, are voluntary decision makers, that is where they're not bound to make decisions as in, as I'll come to, as is the present case. So in that sense, um, we do rely upon that. Now, we're not saying, and, and I don't say my friend went this far, but we're not saying that um, there's um, some kind of legal presumption that if there's no duty to provide reasons, you can never draw an inference. That is not our position at all. We just say, if there's no duty to provide reasons, it is much more difficult to draw any inference that the omission of some express mention to something, um, you know, is is readily turned into an inference. Um, so there is a case which I should perhaps draw the court's attention to. I think it is in the bundle. It is um, Ford XA. Um, and I seem to not have a note of that. What, what tab it is in the bundle? Yeah. Tab 12 in the bundle. Um, have you sorry. got a citation, Mr. So it's tab 12 in the bundle, and it's um, relevant discussion. Justice Thorley starts at about 174, but perhaps most critically, one. Seven seven, um, and one sees his he, honour. Um, I mean, I won't read through it, but we say that that is entirely consistent with our submissions, and we just embrace his honour's summary of the law, which includes M sixty four, um, uh, being applied in circumstances just the same as we say they should be applied. Now, my friends say, well, against that proposition is Tawlahi. Um, as we've said, we don't say there's never a circumstance where an inference could be drawn. Tawalahi was, of course, quite a different case to this 
case because in Taolahi, which my friend took the court to, if, if you want to go back to that, which I think is in my friend's bundle, in paragraph 66, what was missing there, I mean, there's, a, there's an indication of what that case involved in paragraph 66, and the essence of it was that the minister's statement of reasons indicated that the minister did not avert to the proper operation of 501c in making the cancellation. And then the reasons did little more than repeat certain things in the issues paper. There was no express mention in them of the fact that the cancellation decision could be revoked. So that was the omission. So the omission there was the failure to deal with some aspect of the operation of the law. Um, now, I accept that that court, you know, drew that inference in that case, um, but it's a question of fact. Um, and we say, for reasons that I will further develop, that in this case, uh, there's really no cogent reason to, to uh, draw an inference that the minister didn't consider these issues, having regard to all the matters that were before him. Um, I mean, the, the applicant's case is that there was matters relevant before him that somehow he just missed them. Now, that, that, that notion seems to be based on two propositions that attachment H where, the, where where some of that material was wasn't mentioned but as I've indicated it was mentioned so the minister is taken to have read it and then the second ma matter is my friend's reported re repeated reliance upon um, paragraph 22 Roman 2 and this, the alleged wrong references there or, or or references that didn't support the proposition and, and as I've indicated, those references did support the principal proposition in that paragraph, and the parenthetical proposition was supported inter alia by attachment H. So, um, in a sense, that undercuts the whole his whole case. So, what we have is the minister having material that was relevant, that was before him, that he took into account, and were to believe that the minister somehow didn't think of the um, consequences uh, of making a, uh, or what would have been the consequences of making a cancellation decision. Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Decision. Sorry, Mr. Lloyd, did I cut across the Chief Justice there? Uh, no, you go ahead, Justice. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you what irrationality means in this context. Um, does it mean no more than uh, bearing in mind that it's not the same um, as a failure to take into account a relevant consideration in the pico wall sense? Uh, is it sufficient that uh, the minister was aware of the matter or is it necessary to show that he was aware of it and took it into account and conducted some sort of balancing exercise and so on? What, what, what do you say about that? Well, I mean, the first question is whether or not he, um, well, they, for them to succeed, they have to show that he failed to, um, you know, consider the issue. And they say there's nothing in the in the decision about it. And 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 as a result, you should infer from that that uh, he didn't do it. And we say, no, he doesn't have to do a comprehensive set of reasons. The Act under Section 133 C, E, and F draws a distinction. Under Section 133C1, there's an obligation to give reasons. Under Section 133C3, there is no obligation to give reasons. So you shouldn't just start from the proposition that if it's not mentioned, it wasn't done. One starts from a broader proposition, which is, well, it's not mentioned so-called expressly. But then a whole lot of other things are mentioned, which suggests that those matters were taken into account in the context of um, the decision-making process. And when they're taken into account in a, in a matter involving both a broad discretion and a public interest, so he has in mind the, the, the possibility of um, unrest, whatever his decision, um, uh, it becomes then impossible to think that one should infer that he didn't, you know, can, that that wasn't part of the balance. That, that I think is broadly how we would put it. 
Um, I mean, we separately have an argument that he didn't need to consider it, but that that's, in a sense, in the alternative. Well, it's not the alternative, but it's it's an, an additional argument. Um, so I think I've addressed Taulahi and plaintiff M64. So we, we ultimately say it's a matter then to consider all of the the relevant indicia. In paragraph 38, there are references to the fact that there's no obligation to give reasons in this case. Uh, paragraph 39 is just the Wushan Liang principle and, and a recent authority um, expounding upon it. Um, I won't expand upon that. Um, for the sixth proposition, I'll just rely upon my written submissions. But that, that deals with matters of statutory context. Um, if I turn now then to our submissions as to why the finding should not be made, um, that's dealt with from the section beginning from paragraph 46. Um, now, remembering that this counter argument is basically about the consequences um, or perhaps particular consequences, specific consequences of uh, a decision uh, to cancel. Um, uh, now, in paragraph 47, um, there we make uh, three points. Um, the, the, the one is just drawing on the point we've already made that the mere omission uh, isn't enough to support the inference. Um, and uh, so that this isn't a case. There are some cases where somebody has um, had natural justice and they've advanced an argument and then there's no mention of that whole argument in the decision and then you you might be inclined to draw an inference that that argument wasn't considered um, because you would have expected to see you know some some something more specific about it um, we're not in that category this is not a case where there was natural justice or where a particular argument was specifically raised which we say weakens further that possibility um, there's no suggestion that the minister didn't understand the statutory criteria so that that also weighs in favor of consideration or at least doesn't weigh against it um, and then we say given that the onus is on the applicant um, uh, the court shouldn't in, in this case make a finding in their favor but then we go further from 49 and onwards and refer to matters which we say show that the minister did consider the consequences of, of um, both sort of the, the cancel, non-cancel, the consequences of his decision, which um, whether it be cancel or not cancel uh, in, in broad terms. Um, So starting at 49, we refer there to the evidence um, that the minister has sought to consider things broadly. Perhaps I should go to the statement again um, at paragraph 7. At one point, my friend said that the minister didn't make inquiries and didn't explain why. Well, that, that's just simply wrong. So if, if the court sees in the statement paragraph six, that's the minister saying that he's not bound to make inquiries, knowing that he could make inquiries and then giving reasons for why he, he wasn't going to make inquiries. So it's it's just not a case, like my friend says, of the minister not knowing. It's in that context that in paragraph seven, he says, you know, taking into account the fact that he hasn't had the benefit of, uh, of what might have come if, if um, uh, you know, information had been sought. Um, he, he's done his best to consider the matters alive to the fact that uh, the applicant, it's, his views wasn't sought on things. So that suggests that the minister is trying to look at things broadly. So that is evidence to suggest that the minister was trying to take a broad view. And it's in that way that we use it. My friend says, well, it doesn't prove that he looked at this specific thing. No, but it does show the, the mindset of the minister to look broadly. So he's got all this information before him. 
My friend accepts that it is in the information before him. He just says it's not in the reasons. We say, well, it's in the information before him. The reasons don't have to be exhaustive. He, he's saying that he's looking at all these things. Then in paragraph 50, we say the matters in there. It's clear that the minister knew there were people who supported um, what they understood to be the applicant's position on COVID. Um, it also referred to opposing reactions um, and to sources of discord. So the minister is aware that there are consequences for his decision, we say, both ways. That language is, is entirely consistent with, if not implicit, of that understanding. Um, that is, the minister, we say, was aware that there would be groups who would be opposed to a decision to cancel. Um, the minister, we say, must be taken to be aware that this decision would be result in a high level of media, um, or whichever way he decided it. Um, and so we say broadly, that means the minister was aware of the possibility of reactions, whatever he decided. That is reactions from groups that may affect health and also that may affect good order. Um, indeed, the minister expressly indicated that he was aware of unrest. Um, and, and that is mentioned in our submissions at 52. So there'd already been some unrest under the previous decision. So uh, to cancel. So it's not like the minister was unaware of that possibility. He, he was referred to it um, as a possibility to cancel. Um, uh, and so th that is a factor that is taken into account, we say, expressly in that regard, which is at least part of um, the notion of, of, of both the so-called binary view. He, he's decided to cancel, but he knows um, uh, that, that there are consequences each way, we say. We say the court should infer um, in relation to that re reference to unrest, that the minister would have been aware of the protests in Melbourne on Tuesday, the 11th of January, involving persons supporting the applicant. Um, again, on the Vian view, I mean, this is, it's not just some random protest somewhere in the world. This is the day after the court's um, decision to set aside the cancellation. There's a, a protest about the exact matter that the minister has told the world, in effect, that he's going to reconsider. Um, so it's impossible to imagine that that wasn't within the minister's um, understanding and that we would say is at least part of what is being referred to as uh, some unrest having already occurred. Um, now, in paragraph 46 of the um, submissions, which are referred to in paragraph 52, the minister takes that unrest into account against cancellation. So that was a factor against cancellation. Um, uh, that is, the factor in favour of not cancelling would be less unrest from those groups. Um, and that's pretty self-evident, but it seems to be contested that somehow the minister missed that. Uh, at 53 in our submissions, there's a reference to a range of adverse consequences um, that other adverse consequences that were considered, uh, and these were matters that were, were raised by the submissions on behalf of the applicant. Um, and I won't read them out, but they, you know, they involve, you know, if you make a decision to cancel, it will prejudice Australia's economic interests, it will create an appearance of politically motivated decision making, um, it will call into question its border security principles and Australia's border security principles and policies. So th there was a range of adverse consequences, including, um, you know, this notion of um, you know, political issues, if I put it broadly. Um, uh, so again, this is the minister being confronted with and actually expressly referring in his submissions to these e exact possibilities. So this is not a minister who's not thinking of the consequences of a cancellation decision or a non-cancellation decision. Um, 
And paragraphs 55 to 60 highlight the material before the minister. Now, we say that the fact that this was all before him, um, I mean, my friends, I think, rely upon it as saying, this is the stuff that should have been considered. Um, we say, well, it's in documents that are referred to by the minister, um, and, uh, and it was in any event in the submission, and the court should be very slow you know, not lightly to come to the conclusion that these issues were not part of his consideration in considering in, in both the public interest and the discretionary elements of his decisions um, amongst others. So we say that um, that is all evidence that is sufficient to um, reject the submission that the court should make a finding that the minister failed to consider um, the consequences relied upon by the applicant. So that is our first argument in relation to, to that matter. Now, I see the time, Your Honour. If Your Honour wants to have a break now. I think that might be convenient, Mr Lloyd. Um, without um, binding you, uh, or without intending to put pressure on you, how um, how long do you think you'll be? Um, well, I'm about just under two thirds of the way through my speaking notes, so uh, slightly less than as long as I've already been. I think I think about I've been around, around about an hour. So probably about an hour. Around about an hour. You will take. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the court will adjourn uh, until half past one Australian Easter Daylight Saving, um, which is um, uh, one o'clock in Adelaide. And